How's everyone doing? There is some, I'm having some childhood memory. There's a TV show. Someone tell me in the comments, who used to say, hey, you guys? That was like their catchphrase. If anyone knows, they'll get a, I don't know. Well, they'll get my admiration uh, or my sympathies for knowing the same outdated references that I know. What's up, guys? How are you? Welcome to The Reason live stream. We're back. We were off last week. We didn't plan to be off last week, but we had a little bit of a little bit of a scheduling hiccup, and we actually had to uh, to bump uh, Khalil and Tariq Beats to uh, to a later TBD live stream. We are going to get them back, um, but you know what? We thought we had this thing come up, and we thought, yeah, you know, we, we got Sarah next week, so we'll just we'll just bump them, and it'll be a week off, and then we'll come back with Sarah, and it'll all be good. So, so that's all the same. I hope everyone's doing good. I am uh, just looking to see who all we got uh, in here and what's going on. Lance, David, hi, everybody. Uh, thought sequel, hi, Reason fans. I agree, hi, Reason fans. Good to see everybody. I'll tell you, I, um, I, I, nearly, <laughs> I nearly changed our thumbnail. I'll just, I'll just say this up top. I nearly changed our thumbnail today because um, there's a lot of live streaming. I don't know if anyone's been browsing around on YouTube. There's a lot of live streaming going on today, and it's going on with a, a slightly different topic. So I nearly changed our live stream to this today because I thought maybe we'd actually get uh, more uh, more people coming in and watching. But then they might be very confused by uh, that our hot take about this uh, trial of the century that everyone seems to be watching now is uh, not actually our, our hot take is going to be about songwriting so that would confuse a lot of people i didn't change the thumbnail but anyway um well listen guys i'm quite excited for our guest today i will say this i'm i might be selfishly excited because really in some ways this live stream is an excuse for me to take a master class a one-on-one -on -one master class it's like a back door to me asking questions that I want to know and get help that I desperately need uh, in songwriting. And uh, hopefully, though, hopefully that I'm not alone in that uh, and that everybody else here all feels, even if they have experience in songwriting, feels that they could use some uh, some extra help with it. Breaking news here. Hang on a second. Bethany coming to the rescue. I think Hey You Guys was the Muppets. I think you're right. I think it was the Muppets. W was it? Is it an animal thing? No, he was he just like animal. I mean, that was that was all him. He wouldn't say, "Hey, you guys." I wonder who said, "Hey, you guys." Okay, we're close. So Bethany got us on the track, or she misled us, and now she's taken me with her into some weird Mandela effect wrong track here. But um, anyway, yeah. Hey, you guys, or is it is it Steve Martin? No. Oh man, it could be anything. It could be any one of these weird little '70s references swimming around in Baby Ryan's brain when he was a kid. Um, anyway, guys, yeah. So I do hope uh, uh, everybody else finds this as useful as I do today. We're going to be talking about songwriting, and there's two. I'll just say this up front: there's two types of people who will take uh, benefit from talking about songwriting with Sarah, and that is people who are trying to write songs or write songs and want to kind of glean her wisdom. Great. Then you might be a person who's like, hey, I'm a beat maker. I don't make songs. I don't write songs. That's I work with artists who write songs. You know, I make a beat and I get it to the artist and they <clears throat> write the songs. Well, I would say you almost are the most important people to be watching because I have talked to uh, people who are who started sort of beat beat makers, going to beat battles, doing the sort of you know up and coming like producer beat maker sort of thing, and I've heard from more than one of them that there actually came a moment when they had to learn how to fit what they do, how to make room for a songwriter. They had to understand the songwriting process so that they knew what not to do that would sort of turn off a songwriter. And there's a lot of things that as a a beat maker, you know, uh, or a producer, you know, we we're sort of taught to like just throw ideas into our songs and kind of make them sound big and layered and complex and exciting and have things popping in and effects and risers and downlifters and impacts and you know vocal sweeps and all these things that go into making a beat sound really exciting, and that they're all cool, but if you don't understand the songwriting process and you don't understand where the song is going to fit into your beat, a songwriter, they're not going to you know, send you an email and say, no, thanks. I'm not interested because this was too busy and I didn't see where I fit in. They're just going to say, no, thanks or, or not respond or whatever. So if you've been making beats and been 
sort of finding it a little like maybe you're not getting maybe you're getting ghosted by the people you want to collab with or you're getting turned down or or you're just not getting the number of nibbles on the hook that you wish you were this is also for you guys even if you don't write songs joey luck coming in strong hey you guys from the goonies i think he is completely correct i believe that was sloth from the goonies joey Thank you for not letting me get pulled into the Muppet vortex of misremembering. Uh, no offense to you, Bethany. I was right there with you. I thought it was the Muppets. But I, hearing that now, I think it was the Goonies, wasn't it? Hey, you guys. Yeah, I, I think I'm even doing it wrong, which makes it that much harder to identify. Um, but uh, anyway... Well, um, uh, Vivian Schmidt, I'm excited if she convinces me to buy Reason 12. I don't know if that's, uh, I, I hope, let me just say before I bring Sarah on, I hope that's not Sarah's agenda because uh, this Reason live stream is not a sales pitch. It's a, it's a music making pitch. So uh, if you get Reason 12, hey, we're, we're of course happy to have you join the, the Reason community. In fact, you, welcome. You're already here. You're already in the Reason, Reason community. So we're happy to have you this far anyway. But uh but Sarah, uh, you're waiting in the wings. Uh, you better not be uh, setting up some kind of a sales pitch for Reason 12, uh, or I'll, I'll give you the hook right away. That's not what this is about. Anyway, why don't we um, why don't we do this? Oh, see now, you know what I've done is I've created Cookie Monsters. Now a suggestion. No, I think it is. I think it's slow. I think Joey Luck got it right, guys. I don't think we need to keep sending every single, you know like childhood reference from my sort of age range you know, people are gonna be going oh it was the the greatest american heroes uh catchphrase which that's a, that's probably even <laughs> i probably just lost the 35 and under crowd uh, with maybe even the 40 and under crowd i don't know <laughs> anyway oh wait uh oh uh oh uh oh kingpin ronin no it's the muppet this hang on a second this i'm gonna bring sarah in early we maybe she's got an opinion on this we got to get to the bottom the the most important thing we could discuss on this entire live stream now is what is hey you guys from Sarah, is it Fozzie Bear? I I would have put money on it that it was a Muppet of some kind. It felt I, right. It but sounds then, very familiar. What you, well, I think what everyone's learning is just how susceptible I am to suggestion because Bethany said the Muppets and I was like, yeah. Then Joey said Goonies and I was like, yeah. Now King Penrone is saying the Muppets again and I'm right. And you're saying the Muppets. I'm right back with you. I, I wish I could do a live poll. If there was a way to do a live poll, <laughs> I, I would think it would uh, be a, a critically important poll for us now to to uh, all figure I it out. I literally have, like, I have notes to look this up later because oh. I'm pretty sure I won't sleep until I find the clip. Please, please do. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if if it weren't if it weren't completely unprofessional, I would end this live stream right now just so I could go Google it, figure it out, and then bring everybody back. But uh, I won't do that to everybody or you. Um, how you doing? So I, I brought you on on a Muppet-related uh, issue, but um, good to have you <laughs> on the live stream, and, and welcome to uh, the Reason live stream and the Reason community. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is legendary. This is iconic. I've I've watched so many YouTube videos with you teaching me things through reason, and I swear I didn't come with a sales pitch, but I am a reason user, <laughs> and this is this you know is I, I had I a um, I had a Zoom call. I'm gonna uh, do I name drop? I'm gonna name drop because I I feel like it's even dumber to not name drop. I had a <laughs> Zoom call with uh, Ian Kirkpatrick last week, and we were talking about a few different things. But I was you know I'm here in this space. And he also referred to that space as iconic. And I, um, to me, this iconic space is just my apartment. So it's like not that iconic. <laughs> In fact, when the with the camera would uh, pan a little bit, uh, people would realize that it's uh, more chaotic than iconic. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> really, it's like I think I showed you before when we met last week. I just have clutter on the floor behind me. It's yeah. just clutter. This is the clean shot here. <laughs> I think all of us, all of us musicians and producers and, and just sort of the content people, everyone in the age of um, of COVID and when we sort of all really kind of lived in these little worlds, we really got really good at knowing exactly what our camera sees and what it does not. Uh, and so for me, that's my desk here. It's like camera doesn't see my desk. So my God, like I'll just, you can hear, you can hear the, the, the jingling of things on my desk. I love it. <laughs> well, um, uh, Joey Luck is now saying, I think Nelson Mandela said, hey, you guys, I think he probably, you know, and he might have done it. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the uh, with the Mandela effect, but it's a, a fascinating uh, little sort of psychological thing that happens to people. So, yeah, you might be right, Joey. Like, if, if, if everyone believes that, that's probably true. Um, another comment, Morgan Freeman got a start on Electric Company. That's an equally good, uh, equally good theory there as to where it comes from. I will be, oh, wait, oh, wait. 
more breaking news. I just Googled it. It's the Goonies. Maybe it's the Muppets too. Kim, you're not helping us here on uh, Saw. I mean, you are helping us, <laughs> but but you're 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 so diplomatic that uh, it's going to leave us all wondering. But okay, so Goonies, <laughs> Joey. I'm sorry that I said you were wrong. Apparently, you were right, according to Kim. We'll uh, we'll see how that uh, shakes out at the. I, I at this point, I mean, we I might even need to post a a story on our uh, reason know, Instagram maybe, with the yeah. answer. Those seem to be the two trending answers. It's either they Muppets do. or the Goonies. They do. They do. Um, but anyway, well, listen, Sarah, so we just jumped into the action right here, but um, I, I want to, I guess, maybe make an official introduction for you into the Reason community. People already know you maybe more than they even realize they know you. Um, you are uh, the, the, the voice of record, the featured voice for the BBX vocoder uh, song that came out and I used in the video for BBX. And so <clears throat> if anyone out there uh, has enjoyed here, this, I've got the, one of the remix versions of it, but this song. Is it the truth or are you making moves? Did you read the room and see me and just know exactly what to give away? Oh, saying all the right things. Is it the truth or are you making moves? I just wanted to keep going. All right, all right. <laughs> that, was, that remix is so good. God, I, I can keep Sean. going. I can just keep oh, going. So good. Such a catchy little tune. Uh, so yeah, so you you did the vocal on that, and that was a um, a collaboration between uh, Reason Sound Pack creator and and just general all around musical uh, savant Sean Murray. <laughs> And uh, and I I paired I, I played sort of musical matchmaker a little bit of pairing you with Sean because I thought for what I wanted to do for that. Um, song I, I basically what i wanted to do was i needed a vocal <laughs> that's really what i needed i needed a vocal that could be vocoded and it would sound cool and in thinking of who to do that you jumped to mind so i approached you and Yay. you knocked it out of the park i gotta say uh, i mean thank you that was so much fun that was like every now and then a project just comes along and it's like wow this was just a lot of fun all the way through you gave great direction just a little peek behind the scenes like ryan gave us the creative direction sort of what his vision was for it how it would be used great detail for me to then be able to go in and craft something that had impact or had had meaning and fit the uh the end result that it was going to be used for and of course the track was incredible if anybody's on my instagram you've seen me talking about the track but right. sean sent over a first draft that was already just like all right here we go this is great like let's do it so it was you, fun all you actually through. you know the one of the things uh you you were asking you know sean was sending me you were on cc and sean was sending me kind of his first draft of uh, like here's kind of an idea and I think you asked a question when you were like uh, can I should I get started and I mm -hmm. I think I essentially said something like no unless you you know have an idea already I don't want to stand in your way but you know maybe we'll get it dialed in a little better and I don't want to I don't want to sort of be writing something and then we make a change and then you got to write again mm -hmm. and uh, and then like 12 hours later I think we had like you know six vocal stem stacks from you with this totally killer <laughs> Like, and like a verse and a chorus and ad libs and like all this stuff. And it was so good. And I'm glad we didn't make changes to the music that necessitated changes. But I almost, as soon as I heard it, I was like, we don't need the, yeah, the music is right because the vocal is right. And it just all kind of clicked in one instant second there. When you, oh, I love that. You know, when you write to something like that, I'm I'm gonna I'm jumping into the, this process. We'll pull back actually. Yeah. And we'll talk about how you got into songwriting and all that. But but when you're writing something like that, where you're sort of writing to a brief, and you're, you know, it's not like you had something you had to say and you just really mm -hmm. had to, you know, and it wasn't like you heard this or made this thing that then inspired that you were. It was like sort of made to order creativity. Is that hard to do, or is that even sometimes easy to do to separate yourself from any personal ownership of? An idea yeah great question um it just kind of depends on the day i mean songwriters are storytellers and you know where that story comes from it just kind of it kind of depends on the day um oh my gosh which which part of this do i cover first <laughs> i always always try to bring something of mine into every something of me into everything that i'm writing i i think I'd even go so far as to say that it's kind of impossible for writers to not put themselves at least a little bit into everything that they're writing. 
gotcha. uh, don't like blanket statements, but we all have felt emotions. We all have stories. We all have life experiences and that works its way into our music. So for this particular song, you said it was made to order creativity. I love that. That's perfect. That's exactly what writing to a brief is like or writing for somebody else. If you're in the room with an artist and you need to capture their story. Um, I'm looking for, okay, what can I relate to in this story? Because if I can relate to it and I'm writing sort of from that, that universal experience, other people are going to be able to relate to it too. And right. that's, that's a connection that you're going to make with anybody listening to the song. Mm. Um, so for moves in particular, <laughs> what of me did I bring to moves? It's such a fun song. I, I mean, just as an Easter egg, one of the lines is like um, two shots of whiskey. And next thing I know we're talking. And I was like, should I put whiskey in here? It's so overused, but but I'm from Nashville and it fits so well. <laughs> like I need a two-syllable word here. It fits. Um, like I love drinking whiskey at bars and stuff like that. Why not? We're gonna put this in. Sure. Um, and just that emotional quality of like talking to somebody that you're not really sure of yet. Definitely right. been in that position before. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think so. I so I have um <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll just say, like I, I sort of said in the intro, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm hijacking this live stream as a as a secret, a uh, one on one masterclass with you here. Uh, so <laughs> in my own in my own songwriting, you know, I, I've I've written a few, a few, and when I say a few, I'm we're counting them on one hand. Um, sort of songs that are sort of like, oh, these are songs I've written. But I did a project five years ago, six years ago, maybe, um, where I actually was um, uh, contacted by the people who are making the Dancing with the Stars iPad game, the official iPad game, you know, um, cool. and they wanted uh, some songs made that were like effectively, um, you know, what what actually it's not dissimilar from this project in a way. They were sort of like inf influenced by how do I say this in a way that doesn't sound like uh, copyright infringement? Sound alikes is kind of <laughs> the industry term, but it's like songs that sort of have the essence of other songs where you would hear me go like, oh, that's like a this type of song or this type of artist song without it actually being that artist song so they came to me and they had you know reference tracks by some some big artists from that time and they needed songs written this sort of sounded and felt like that for the game and i at, at that point I, I couldn't even count songs i'd written on one hand i just was i produced music and i made music and i i'd done a lot of instrumental but like actually lyrics and stuff i hadn't done and what i was shocked by was all of the years of writer's block that i had beforehand it went away for two reasons one i had a deadline but also because I didn't feel it. I was writing these generic things. I mean, that's not a necessary thing to aspire to, but I was writing about things that weren't my own experience. I wasn't trying to be autobiographical. I was like, okay, I'm writing a song and it's about a guy who likes a girl and she doesn't notice him. Cool. And I can, I could write it because I'm, I'm not really self-referencing, you know, in, in that same kind of way. You know, it wasn't like, I wasn't like, Hey, oh, I got to write about that time that someone rejected me, you know? So I, I saw a little bit of that in your process as well, that it's like, you're, this isn't going to be on the next Sarah Spencer album, you know? Um, and yeah. so maybe, maybe it comes a little quicker. I don't know. I love that. The way you said it um, kind of, I think just hit the nail on the head. You're like, I, you know, they gave me these parameters and then any writer's block that I had was gone. Sometimes it is so nice to just kind of know where the box is, yeah. know what the expectations are, know what the limitations are. And then you can just take that and run with it. Mm, mm. Um, I do a lot of songs, or in my communities, I have a few online songwriting communities for those who don't know, and we do a lot of writing to prompts. I create prompts and send them out to the community members and be like, here you go, here's a place to start. So if you're scratching your head and you have kind of like no idea, no ideas coming to you, um, nothing that is exciting to you for the day, give yourself some parameters. Mm. Um, that can be sometimes all you need. Be like, okay, the room is starting to form. I see some structure. I see some some walls happening around. I'm going to go in this direction and mm. finish the picture here. Mm. Um, that's why your creative direction was so helpful at the beginning of the moves process because I was like, okay, I know what they want and I know what I can deliver and this is, this is going to be great. Right. Well, it uh, you wrote a banger. The whole office was singing it. <laughs> I don't. They might still be singing it. I'm not over there in Sweden, so I don't know. But let's let's jump back for a second because I do want to, you know, without you know putting you on the couch and getting your whole life story here. I I, I do think it'd be interesting for people to understand kind of how you came to be and how a songwriter comes to be a songwriter and whether that comes from 
you know, do you just plant your flag and say, I, I hereby am a songwriter? Or does it, is it like, oh, after a certain number of successful, you know, placements or sinks, or I don't even know the term you would use, um, you, then you go, oh, I, I guess I'm a songwriter. Like, did it, for you, were you a, a musician performer that sort of came into songwriting and collaborating, collaborative songwriting by accident, deliberately, uh, or, or what? What's your, what's the journey there that, yeah, kind of, and what oh what brings you to Nashville, really, too, as well? Yeah, oh, the journey is so long. I won't go into <laughs> all of the detail, all the gory details. But um, I started off as a kid writing alone in my room, probably with reason. Not gonna lie, I've been using reason well on and off since I was literally a teenager. Mm. Probably in high school is when I started with reason, but started writing alone in my room just to get things out of my head just compelled to do it that turned into my dad who's a musician has a home recording studio uh, mm. teaching me a few things here and there about that so now i was able to record my ideas um and then somewhere along the way my parents and i realized i sing and so <laughs> we started doing singing and um, started taking voice lessons, started taking like performance type coaching, things like that, mentorship, uh, did did acting, child acting, like all of the child entertainment things, modeling, all that stuff. Um, I'm from central Florida, a little town called Ocala. So we spent a lot of time in Orlando, which was like our nearest music and entertainment hub. Um, all through my teenage years, just on stages, performing, doing the artist thing, the music artist thing on stage, singing covers to tracks and occasionally singing to my own material that we had like demoed. Um, I never played an instrument really on stage. Um, was doing the pop star thing, you know, like the, like the Britney Spears and sure, the Christina sure. Aguilera and the divas and things like that. And this like, is I, I, in like sort that. of, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to make a, an inference based on your age. This is post- um, like M Mouse Kateer Club, but it's like at the same time, Florida is still very much like kind of a recent, like in the era that you're doing this, Orlando is to pop what Seattle was to, you know, like grunge rock in sort of the, the later 90s. We're like, oh, the scene just happened. It's like it's all come from here. So I would imagine it, it was a place, a good place to be for kind of getting into yes. that stuff, you know? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I love that you know that because I feel like I don't know how many people really know that as general knowledge that Orlando was kind of like the small, I don't want to say small, but like not a New York or an LA, but a, a music hub. I mean, like O Town, the boy right. band O Town came right. from Orlando, so it stands for Orlando and the O. Um, so yeah, huge music scene there. And this was like early 2000s. So mm -hmm. right at the time where all those, you know, pop bands, boy bands, girl bands are coming out, things like that. So that was the vibe. That was the energy, soaking it in, doing the thing, getting on stage, you know, doing the whole song and dance and all that. Sure. Um, I actually started collaborating around that time. I was about 16 when we did our first co-write together with a guitarist named Steve Morris. Steve is the guitarist of Deep Purple. Um, he's also in Dixie Dregs, Steve Morse Band, and Flying Colors, an incredible, incredible band. Yeah. Um, he's a legend, absolutely legendary guitar player. And he happened to live in my hometown, happened to be oh. friends with my dad. And uh, so I think my parents had approached him about some like, hey, our daughter's interested in music. Like, how can we help her <laughs> like have a music career? And like, do you have any advice for us? And from that point, Steve kind of became a mentor. Wow. And we released a project together in like, I think it was 2010. It was like 18 or 19, something like that, called Angel Fire. Wow. Um, so it's the two of us. We co-wrote all these songs together, recorded them over at Steve's house, um, and put it out. And I love it. It's such a precious, precious. I hate, I mean, precious is not the, the industry word, but like it is precious <laughs> to me. It's so precious. I love A new that precious project. release from Marilyn Manson. No, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there, there that was is, that. And it, that, yeah. that is... Um, my my dad always had this uh, thing when I was sort of in my teen years, and and similarly, like I was getting into engineering, audio engineering, and and I was playing music, but I was sort of really kind of sort of heading into that production uh, interest. And I remember he had this sort of methodology that he would always espouse, which was find someone who is doing what you want to do. And then talk to them, ask them how they got there, walk that path. They've already figured it out. Just let them have led the way for you, you know. And he was 
um, always kind of asked me like, so who is, who is doing what you want to do and and how do you, you know, how do you do it? And for me, that led to sort of local, you know, some mentorships that I was doing locally with recording studios and stuff like that. So that sounds like you did a similar thing. You, you sort of found someone who was, you know, just that little bit ahead of you and sort of, you know, it's like, uh, the way, you know, the people that, um, when an ambulance goes by, they kind of use the gap in traffic to like, you know, kind of <laughs> skirt ahead. <laughs> yeah. Or is it, yeah. Like you get behind a semi truck and you're just kind of like catching yeah. the wind. Yeah. Yeah. Them right. Right. On gas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Definitely. that is cool. So that was 2010. I, um, you put yeah. that out. You're in Florida at that time. Um, and what, what brings you up to Nashville? Because Nashville really is, you know, it's actually funny to be from going from Florida to Nashville. I'm about to make a baseball reference. It's like spring training to the big leagues. You know, it's like you're Nashville is, it doesn't get more songwriter, uh, you know, I guess competitive, but also, um, that's, you know, real deal. So, so what brings you up to Nashville? Yeah. So in a very roundabout way, I found myself up here. I went to college, I studied graphic design, something completely different, um, and I'm grateful that I did because it's helped me a lot over the years. It's kept me earning income in an industry where it's really, really difficult to earn income, especially at the early stages. Um, but I, I graduated, but I never stopped writing. I was always, well, I had long dry periods because I was focused on my degree, but I sure. was learning about the Nashville way of songwriting through like NSAI mainly, Nashville an S. Nashville Songwriters Association International. Um, it's a membership community mm. here in Nashville. They have a ton of great resources. If you're just considering like, how, how do I start beginning writer? What is it even like? Very yeah. Nashville focused country music. Um, so I was sort of learning how to craft a song through them, through a lot of their online materials. And eventually I just said, you know what? I'm going to have to do this. If I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. Mm. I would, I graduated from school. I was working um, at a software company as a designer, as one of their in-house designers, and was working on such greatest hits as branding Common Core for the Florida state government and building government websites. <laughs> and <laughs> it was not exactly the dream. I mean, I enjoyed a lot about it and I had a great team, but like, I didn't, I just knew. It, it really sealed the deal for me that like this isn't what I want to be doing. Right. At that time, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention I was dating a guy that I was very, very interested in and he had just moved up to Nashville. Mm. And our friend group had been talking about moving to Nashville. I'd never considered it before. But when they left and I'm at this software job and I'm like, why not? It's now or never. Right. So right. I wound up being there about eight months before I moved up. And I was like, let's just do it. I had no job. <laughs> just had savings and help and well wishes from my family and just said, let's let's pull the plug and go move to Nashville. I feel like to, that's just. Oh, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was, I was going to say, I feel like that's almost for the, the journey of the Nashville songwriter. Like it almost has to be that. Like what Nashville songwriter says, you know, um, I, I was a trust fund kid. I moved to Nashville. I had, uh, just a year's worth of runway where I could have uh, floundered and, uh, I was very comfortable. Like that's, that doesn't seem to be the, uh, the origin story of, of any, any successful songwriter really. That's so funny. Yeah. I mean, there's always that like jumping off the cliff. Even if mm. you, if, if it's something that you're scared of, but you know, you're pulled to at the same time. So I wish I could remember who told me this, but I, I love this quote. It's like, use your fear as a compass. Your fear mm. is a compass. Um, of course, there's different, different varieties of fear, but I'm talking about the kind of thing that you want so badly, but it makes you so scared because yeah. it's so important to you and you don't want to mess it up. Right. That's that compass pointing you toward your purpose. Interesting. I, um, someone yeah. once said, um, and it stuck with me in a similar way. They said the right opportunities in life to take are the ones that are scary and exciting in equal measure. And yeah, that's, good. you know, if it's, if it's more scary than exciting, don't do it. If it's, if it's, <laughs> uh, you know, exciting, but, but not so sc scary, then maybe that's actually telling you something about sort of, maybe it's not challenging enough or whatever, you know? Um, yeah. so yeah, so you, you went for it. I totally right call. I mean, I imagine you would agree because you, you know, imagine you're pleased with where you are in life, but I could, that's one of those like sliding doors moments where it's like, you could have been in a blink of an eye, you could have been, you know, 14 years into like now you're working on the 2019 common core, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh God. boy. <laughs> I don't even, what a bleak future. I just, 
And it's great for the people who want to be doing it. I just sure. wasn't that gifted designer who wanted to be. Right. <laughs> doing when, that. when you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, but, but at that point you, then you already had, um, you've been writing, so you, you were a songwriter uh, for your own sake, right? You were writing your own music, your own songs and performing them effectively, right? Kind of. It's so funny. And I'm glad you're asking these questions. They're really, really great questions because this is something that I struggled with for many years and it still kind of rears its ugly head every now and then. And, and folks sort of, I think they don't ask me the same thing in the same words, but I feel it there. When are you a songwriter? When can you call yes. yourself a songwriter? Yes. When can you <laughs> when can you officially like claim that? Um are are you writing songs? You're a songwriter. That's it. You're good. You're good to go. I mean, that is it. Are you a painter? Uh, well, I mean, are you painting? Right. You are? Okay. You're a painter. Right. Like, that's awesome. Um, I struggled with that. I had to learn that. I, I had to learn that coming into Nashville many, many years later, um, that you can be writing every day, pulling double co-writes every day, really just amassing a catalog of material, playing out, doing every show you can, meeting everyone you can, and still have a day job. That day job may be nine to five at an yeah. office. That day job may take up 40, 50 hours a week. That mm. day job may be driving Uber and waiting tables. You're still a songwriter. Like you're still an artist. You're still a musician. You're doing that thing. Um, it doesn't matter where the money's coming from. That doesn't mm. have anything to do with your identity. So, um, I was going to say something else, but it's gone now. The thought is gone. But yeah, that was something that like I had to learn, especially going to school for design. Like, and I was, I was blessed y'all to be able to go to college and get a degree. Yeah. And it wasn't related to music. It well, in a roundabout way. It's helped me a lot with sure. music, but, um, but yeah, was I a designer? I've told people for many years that I was a designer and now I'm just like, you know, I'm a musician, I'm a, musician. <laughs> a, a songwriter and a singer is usually what I say. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I, there's a few different ways I could go here. I want to talk to you a little bit about Song Club and Song Fancy. I want to actually get into sort of looking at sort of your process a little bit. And I think I think you've got some stuff to show us about that, which yeah. uh, I definitely want to do as well. Um, but let's actually, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, for people that don't know, I've got you actually down in your in our little below uh, captions there, Sarah Spencer, mysongclub.com. Let's talk a little bit about, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Song Club um, because, am I not mistaken, I put, you actually, you, you created some custom song prompts for the Reason community, and I you made a little URL for them, and I put them in the description, people, in this uh, YouTube video's uh, description. There's a little custom um, thing there for you if you, uh, follow it. You can get some songwriting prompts, which you'll understand uh, after Sarah's actually told you about it. <laughs> because right now, a song prompt may, may mean nothing to you. So, um, so that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so tell us a little bit about, I guess, the origins of Song Club, and yeah, how, how it came to be and, and and what it is. Yeah, totally. So, Song Club is uh, an online songwriting community that I host. Um, we are a group of songwriters who want to spend more time on our songwriting and are just looking for the structure, the accountability, the community, the collaboration in order to do that in a more meaningful way. Um, I sort of built Song Club with the busy, you know, working or family oriented or in school, like busy everyday songwriter who's like, I'm not, you know, necessarily in a Nashville or an LA or a New York, you know, going hard for career purposes but I want to make music that's meaningful to me and I want to spend more time doing it. I want to enrich my life doing it and I want to get better at it. Yeah. And I want to meet friends <laughs> who are doing it too. Cause there are no friends like songwriter friends. It's really just, you got to have some songwriter friends in your life, you know? Um, so that's what song club is about. And if you guys want to grab some prompts, we do weekly prompts inside of song club. I have a new prompt that goes out every week. So you always have a place to start from. And I have a selection of similar prompts available for you in the description. There's four prompts in there. Um, you sign up with your email address and I email that over to you. Immediately. And what is and an example me, of like a prompt? Yeah. So in this package, I think I have like a word set. We were talking about that one, a theme, a question, and one more, but they're just sort of different ways hmm. to get you 
answering a question for the most part mm. um, to sort of get the wheels turning. It, again, it's adding those parameters in. It's saying, what if this? And then you sort of finish the statement there. So like one of these prompts inside the package below is a word set. And um, that is 10 words. And the challenge for you is to write a song with at least five of those 10 words. And mm. if you really want to push yourself, use all 10. But what story can you tell with these words? Mm. How well can you tell the story? Um, can you tell the story that's different in a way than what the prompt maybe first leads you to like right. suggest the path it first leads you down? Right. Um, and it's it's a great way to establish those habits of like, okay, I'm sitting here, I'm not inspired, but I want to get better at my craft. How do I do it? Start mm. with something like a prompt and you can be off to the races. I think the the reason community and anyone watching who works in reason and and knows that feeling of opening up a blank document, um, there's this there can be this paralyzing situation where like because I can do everything, how do I do anything? How do I start yes. what is the you know and so and and it's a trick that producers have known for a long time you i don't know wouldn't, wouldn't call them prompts necessarily but it's like you sort of just pick almost arbitrarily i think i'm going to use this instrument or i'm going to use distortions on everything or i'm going to uh, play with the idea of reversing beats and see what happens like you sort of just kind of point to where you want to go in a direction that's and and things may happen. You may make little changes along the way, and you end up may end up somewhere. Maybe the thing you do that day has no reverse beats and has no distortion on anything, and didn't use that instrument that you set out to make. But that was just kind of the the lubricant to get you going. You know, to, to help the friction of just looking at this, you know, this endless set of options that you could go with, and that it actually can actually limit you. So uh, that makes sense that a, a prompt can do a similar thing for you. So. Um, so like I Definitely. said, guys, there are, um, there's a link down below for some songwriting prompts if you want to try that. But why don't we get to your actual process? Sarah Spencer, I'm going to ask you the most open-ended question in the world. How do you write a song? Ah, um, <laughs> <laughs> talk about blank page syndrome. Oh my God. Uh, where do I start? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I brought a couple songs if you guys want to hear them. I, I tried to find you the roughest, crunchiest, most embarrassing work tapes so mm. that you could see. <laughs> like cool, like, yeah. No, that's not true. Some of them are with my co-writer and I, and he's incredible. But sorry, my microphone. Uh, yes, the old, uh, Here we go. old Logitech uh, focus trick. I know it well. <laughs> yes, the Logitech focus trick. Uh, um, just a, a couple of comments here. David uh, Hanerato uh, says he's been having writer's block for two years. David, I hope that we... Um, I hope that we can get you out of that writer's block today. Um, so yeah, so sorry, I was interrupting you with that comment, but go for it. I'm going to step back and let no, you. No, you're so good. Um, I, I mean, we don't have to dig into it right now, but David, if you want to leave a follow-up comment about what is it that you do, what kind of writing do you do and what kind of writing do you want to do? I'm happy to give you some suggestions specifically, um, that might help you get out of that rut. Writer's block is a whole thing. I'm not going to say it's not real cause it's very, very real. Mm. Um, but it doesn't have to be the thing that keeps you stuck. Like we have mm. power over it. I promise you that you're mm. much more powerful than the writer's block. Um, so yeah, David, <laughs> leave a follow-up comment if you yeah, want dude, and you can come back to that. Do leave a follow for sure. Cool. Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh, where do I start? Okay, I'm gonna show you something <laughs> embarrassing that's a solo rate. Um, so we're gonna share screen. Are we now? Oh no, cute. No, we're not. Just oh. kidding. <laughs> It says Google Chrome is required. We don't like Oh, yeah. It. But we can just, uh, is it is it audio or something? We can just play the audio, right? Or is there something? We'll play the audio. Okay. Yeah, I was going to share the lyric sheet with you, too. Oh, we'll I see. Play the audio. If you are, I mean, we can semi-improvise here, but if you want to text me or something, the lyric sheet, I can throw it up on my end. I will see if I can get that going for you. Thank you. Actually, can I? I'll just share this Google Doc with you. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, David says he hopes this helps. Uh, we hope so too, David. Um, Ibrell Ozius says learning music theory helps with writer's blog. I'm glad that helped you, Ibrell. Um, that may be true. You know, sometimes I've known in my own uh, songwriting that when I kind of got into understanding, really understanding how chord progressions aren't necessarily, I, when I used to write chord progressions years ago, um, I used to write them as 
Like it was like I was trying to reinvent the wheel every single time. I just I'd play one chord and then I'd go, what chord could I go to? I I could go anywhere and I'd explore every option. And when I started thinking of chord progressions as more, I hesitate to say formulaic, but but you hear a lot of the same chord progressions over and over again. And when I started to understand why that was and um, that sometimes you have limited sets of choices that you can make, it actually helped my songwriting because I wasn't trying to, you know, I, I was I was sort of following uh, the the tracks, the wagon wheels of other chord progressions are already carved into the prairie, and I just had to keep going with it. Um, I don't know how many other metaphors we're going to make for uh, riding in the wake of another wave, or I don't know. There's <laughs> we got the truck, we got all these things. Um, okay, so wait, you sent? Did you send me something? I sent you something. It's probably not going to work um, because you need a Gmail account with that email address. And okay, isn't technology let's, fun, everybody. <laughs> let's see how it goes. It's not necessary. Oh, wait, no, I got, it, I got it. I got it. I got it. Do you got it? Oh, I got okay. it. Let's see. Okay, we're gonna, now we're going to attempt to... Assembly. I said I can put <laughs> it up on screen. I actually don't know if I can put it up on screen. But I'm going to figure out a way to do it real quick. Hang on a second. Uh, I got to make it an so, image. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> really, it's really a live like stream, guys. Thank this you. is... This we're is, live. Da, da, da. It's not pre-recorded. This um, is, uh, I can just give a, you some detail while yeah, he's working on that. Do that. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, we'll just tag, <laughs> tag team this. <laughs> so this song that I brought um, to, that I want to show you guys, first of all, it's a solo, right? This is literally me alone in my studio here with no with nothing to write to. There's no artist that I'm writing for. There is no pitch that I'm trying to make to anybody. Um, this is just me being creative on my own time, which may reflect what a lot of you are doing. Many of you are professionals already, of course, but if, if you feel like that is sort of your vibe, you are not really making music for other people, you're making music for yourself. Um, I wanted to share this one with you. It came from a prompt. Um, and when Ryan has the lyrics up, the prompt is at the top of the lyric sheet and we'll see it there. Actually, I'll just read it. The prompt it. was... Oh, yeah, cool. It was write a song around your memories of the word loyalty. Um, so this, I'm going to pull the screen back up. So memories around the word loyalty, and that is the parameter. So you know now that you have a concept. So I'm sitting here with this concept of loyalty and I'm going, okay, the world's my oyster. Where do I start? Concept of loyalty. Thinking on this for a minute, usually I like to encourage people to free write on the topic because literally free writing or free ah. typing allows you to really just start taking things that are in here in your head and taking up space and just getting them out, getting them out of your head. There is literally something freeing, almost physical about taking something that's in your mind and putting it on paper because you can let it go for the moment. Wow. Um, so free write, if you are ever stuck on a line, stuck on a verse, anything like that, free writing is your BFF. Um, so for this song, I did a little bit of free writing, a little bit of thinking, sort of trying to figure out what are my takes on loyalty. And then you'll see in the prompt, I'm like, man, I'm, what, what do I think about loyalty? Blah, 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 blah. I'm stuck going back to the prompt. I see write a song around your memories of the word loyalty. So that's another cue for me. I'm like, oh, okay, it's memories. Um, what are my personal memories and associations with the word loyalty? Um, so like all good songwriters do, we go back to a breakup. Um, <laughs> so this is a song about an awful ex who I always, always just wondered if he cheated on me. I still don't know to this day. He had plenty of opportunities. So this song is specifically <laughs> around one night in particular. So I've, um, so I've yeah. got it up here now. So yeah, so the, these, um, uh, the first section loyalty uh it in it for me i think that it is anointing where you're going all that stuff is that <laughs> this is just kind of you uh spitballing via keyboard right that's yes gotcha exactly this is what i mean when i'm laughing because it's embarrassing but i brought the most <laughs> embarrassing like crunchy stuff to show you guys because i want you to be able to see like it's really nothing to be embarrassed think, about, to be honest. Awesome. And I, <laughs> listen, I hope everybody watching is just giving you, uh, you know, uh, plenty of applause for being, because listen, if, listen, guys, if you think it's like hard to put yourself out there with a finished song, my God, to put yourself out there in the process is like that much more like just, <laughs> ooh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you into the dark places. I know. But... So kudos to you for that. I mean, my God, I've got a, I've got a notes file. Uh, on my phone of little phrases. If I'm out in the world and I hear kind of a phrase that I like, Oh, that's an interesting phrase, you know? 
um, I'll jot it down and stuff. And then sometimes that gets into like starting to write sort of concepts. But my God, that's like that notes file. I, I need some like like a dead man switch where like if anything were to ever happen to me, the last thing that happens is that notes file gets <laughs> deleted because it's like, oh, no. I have a few of those, too. I have voice memos and I'm like, I need to get this out of my head, but I don't <laughs> want anyone to ever hear it. But good luck me. It's a voice memo now. Right. Um. So, yeah, and, I, and I'm showing you guys this as well to show you that this is process so much. I mean, I feel like with songwriting, we get so, so, so focused on the end result. And is the end song good enough? Is the mm. end song good enough for someone to listen to and to like or pay me money for it? Like, we forget that the process is literally our our gift like that is our our blessing our gift our energy that we've been given by the universe whatever your belief system is like this is for us the mm. writing is for us you are an artist you're a creative and you get to make music and that is just for you and that's totally fine right so this song in particular was definitely just for me this is just me writing to enjoy it and seeing where it goes so you'll see that first stanza up there loyalty through don't let it slip that's just some random me trying to figure things out looking for rhymes looking for a story and then i realize oh i know what this is about now this is about that party where my ex and this girl kind of snuck mm. off and mm. uh, told me they were just going to smoke but like mm, i don't know <laughs> um so that's where it started coming from from there and i won't read through the lyrics but i do have a, a fun voice so uh, but Cool. Yeah. Play. Before you play that, uh, Salav asked a question, music first or lyrics? And I think in the case we're looking at here, this is all, I, I guess you could say lyrics first. I mean, it's not, you actually haven't written a lyric yet, but you also haven't written a note of melody either, have you? Honestly, for me, I tend to write them both at the same time. You do? Okay. Um, yeah, that's just personal preference. And sometimes it may be lyrics first. Sometimes it may be music first. It'll change, but I think I tend to just write them at the same time. Um, but there's no wrong way to do it. Whatever your process is, whatever you're doing first is the right way to do it. Okay, cool. So let's check it. So you, so you made a, um, well, you made, is this like a demo of, uh, so this is me, I would call this a work tape. Um, which for anyone who doesn't know, a work tape is just, just a way to get the idea down. Um, sometimes they are just voice memos on your phone where you're just literally playing your guitar and singing or playing your piano and singing along. Just one take from start to finish um, to get the idea down. And you can just hear the melody and hear the lyric. Um, this I actually did in Reason, but it is literally me just playing chords on a piano. I think for this writing this song in particular, I pulled up a piano that I thought was interesting and that helped me to fit the melody. I put like a little LFO on it. I think I put um, that Nicky Romero one on it hmm. and that gave it sort of a little bit of rhythm, which helped me to write the melody and have the lyrics sort of sink into a rhythm that I thought was interesting. So picking the right instrument sometimes is another great way to just sort of unlock some creativity. But you'll hear me. It's just a scratch vocal. It's not good. Um, it's not tuned or anything. So here we go. I'll just hit the space bar on Ryan. You let me know if it's this coming is, This through. is Sarah's way of saying, be kind, everybody. And you better be kind. She's, no, she's playing fine. a work tape. If, it's if, fine. If you dare make a comment, then you are required by law <laughs> to play your own work tapes and demos and, and the ones from your, the, the first ones you ever, when you were learning your instrument, you got to play that for all of us yes. and, we, and we're going to laugh at them. the first one ever. <laughs> <laughs> we'll publicly shame you on That's the right. <laughs> it doesn't have to be good, guys. Learning by example doesn't have to be good. Um, but yeah, here it is. This is called Loyalty. Younger than 2010. Leaning on your car, making minimum and paying rent. Yeah, you work so hard, so let's have a party. Invite everybody, yeah, let's celebrate this. When the dark will drown and keep you distant. And I forgot what it feels like to leave the room and it's okay to walk away I know I'm probably overstepping And you hate when I'm meeting But where's your loyalty, babe? Time I saw So if you want, we can do the rest of the song Or I can stop here just at a verse chorus That that's kind of the gist of it 
Sarah, I'm mad at you because the- your your work tip. I just set you up with this soft landing, and, and nobody judge her, guys. She's gonna play a little rough thing. It's <laughs> better guys. than anything I've ever written. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> That's so sweet. How dare you? How dare you feign modesty? <laughs> oh no! No, no I it's uh... making it. <laughs> you know how it goes. We all have our different like comfort levels. I'm so glad we're doing this, and like I I want to put some of my insecurities on full display for you guys, as cringe as that is. Yeah. Um, because we all get so embarrassed about things sometimes. It's just like, no, man, we're we're artists making art. This is yeah. what it looks like. The yeah. art. Somebody told me this and she was so right, but the art has always been for the artist first. The process is for you, the writer. The end result is the the bonus at the end. And mm. the beautiful thing about the end result is that it gets to touch other people. Brings right. us together as, as right. humans in this world. So anyway. Francois makes all. an observation. He says draft versions of songs are so intimate. And it's yes. true. That is, you know, and I don't know, is this, I don't know if this is a song you then went forth and produced in a more full sense. Maybe that, maybe that's where we're going with this. I don't know. But, um, but it, that's probably, and just to speak to the producers out there, that is sometimes the challenge. Sometimes artists or songwriters, if it's not yourself, if you're producing them, will bring you one of these things. And it's like, it's almost hard to just be like, that's it. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's so simple and so intimate. And, you know, and sometimes that's the right call. And sometimes you do need to kind of build it up a little more to make it, whether it's to make it more commercial or maybe you're, you know, I, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to build it up beyond that. But um, you're right, Francois. They are really intimate and stuff. For you, um, how is that for you hearing that? Um, <laughs> does that throw you back to that time and that? Maybe not into the mindset of that relationship, but at least into the circumstances of the song and stuff like that. Is it is it like a, a photograph when you look at it and you go, yeah, I remember that was a bad hat. Why did I wear that hat? You know, but like <laughs> just take you back. Sometimes to a little bit, a little bit. It depends on the song and how old it was and or how impactful it was at the time and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I'll admit I, I looked at these songs last night so I could reacquaint myself with like, what was it like writing this? And what are some things that might be helpful that I could share about these songs? Um but yeah, that one in particular, I i mean, if you want to throw the lyrics back up again, I yeah. can kind of lead you through some of the thought process about why these particular words in this particular way. I'm, gonna throw I'm up more a, lyrics oriented. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to throw just a couple of comments for people. Um, you've, you've won over Robert says, she's good. Uh, yeah, da- David says, I'm sorry, that's a demo. Yes, exactly, David. My thoughts, exactly. Uh, I don't think it's fair <laughs> to have demos uh, sound better than my... And most polished things. Um, Bethany thinks you're amazing. Okay, well, we all agree on that. Shout and David again says that sounds Beth. so. Oh, is that sound club uh, member? Yeah, Bethany. we oh. have some song fancy song club. Oh, cool. Here, hey gang. <laughs> all right, let me throw these lyrics back up, and uh, yeah, they're now on screen again. So. Okay, so I mean, I remember going through this last night, and I'm going to try and lead you through things that I, I hope are helpful to know, and not just waxing on about my own lyrics here, but. Um, <laughs> Tell us how clever you are, Sarah. Oh, my God. Here's how (laughs) amazing I am. Um, So what I and what I like to do is honestly, I just a quick disclaimer before I get into it. I'm not a guru. I'm not somebody that's going to tell you the right or wrong way to write your song. What I'm going to share with you is things that have worked for me and sort of a peek inside of what, what I'm thinking when I'm writing and also share some of the craft and commercial songwriting tips that I've learned from living in Nashville and working in the music community and, and, and writing in a way that the end goal is to make dollars. Right. So, and I love a lot of that stuff. I grew up listening to pop music. We talked about Orlando and, and pop divas and stuff like that. So I love songwriting like that. But that being said, um, so here in this first verse here, my attempt is to set up a little bit of a mystery for somebody through as they're listening through the song i my intention here is to have somebody feel like things are going well and then all of a sudden be like oh actually they're mm, not and mm. now i have questions and i as a writer don't specifically want to answer those questions we're just going to touch on whatever the pain point is here so that's sort of what i'm doing here with the very very short phrases very short lines when you say you don't want to answer those questions do you mean you don't want to answer them yet or you don't want to answer them for the listener and let the listener answer them ultimately or is it that oh okay okay i don't want to explicitly say 
hey, my boyfriend went off with this girl to party and I don't know if he cheated on me. Like, I'm not going to give them that direct of an answer, but right. I am going to let them know how I was feeling, which was very confused. Something's wrong. Okay. Is it me? Like, what's going on here? That's the emotion that I kind of want to evoke in the listener. And whether I did it or not is up for debate fully. Right. But the, the way that I executed that here is very, very short phrases – uh, very, very short lines in the verse here. So we've got younger than, like back then, younger than 2010. It's a year. That's a, literally a one word line. Yeah. 2010. Leaning on your car, making minimum, paying rent. Just these little frame by frame, almost like a movie trailer. You're just getting. Pew, 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 yeah. Well, it has a really interesting moments. cadence when you, when you sing it that way. It has such a kind of neat staccato cadence to it. Mm -hmm. Staccato, exactly. It feels like we're just bumping along, you know, in this little life, making minimum wage and, you know, working to pay our rent. You work so hard. So let's have a party. You know, we're young. Let's celebrate all your hard work, invite everyone. And then drowning, keep your distance at the very oh. end of the verse. So like, okay, everything is sort of these little snapshots of this little life that's bouncing along. And then something's happened. We don't know what it is. Then we go right into a chorus and now the chorus take is here's how i'm feeling here's my thoughts and internal feelings about whatever happened but i'm still once again not going to tell you what's happening um i've forgotten what it feels like to leave the room and think that it's okay to walk away um and for me and i'll just we're not answering this question in the song, but a look behind the scenes, like my commentary on this now is like, I was, I felt like I couldn't leave him alone with her because mm. something would happen. Um, but I shouldn't have to feel that way in the first place. And I know I'm probably overthinking, blaming myself, probably overthinking, but you, and you hate when I'm needy, something he would say, but where's your loyalty, uh, babe? Oh my gosh, there's a babe in moves too. I've been doing that for a while, haven't I? <laughs> I just realized that <laughs> throwing babes in there. I have um, a I have a friend who has a thing about uh, the the couple pet name of Babe. His thing is always <laughs> like, he's like, don't don't ever start calling each other Babe because it starts out like, hey Babe, how's it going, Babe? But then you. you use the same word later when you like you've like frazzled the relationship. It's like, I know, Babe, I'm trying, Babe. Like so, it's his thing. <laughs> just, just scream it. Don't ever start with the Babe. <laughs> <laughs> just don't go there <laughs> just don't just it, it'll it'll turn sour it'll be a it'll be, it starts out cute it'll turn sour um I, so uh can we i wonder if we could play the replay what the the demo demo yeah. in in eye rolling air quotes for all of us who uh think it sounds pretty damn good but um <laughs> could we i wonder if we could play it and kind of take a look at now how that kind of comes together having broken it down a little bit for sure. And like, yeah, so that's the lyric breakdown. Um, maybe on this second pass, I'd encourage you guys, you know the story now, which, well, anyway, I'll keep my mouth shut. But like, <laughs> listen to the melody here and listen to the cadence and listen to how it changes in these two sections. Younger than 2010, leaning on your car and making minimum and paying rent. Yeah, you work so hard, so let's have a party, invite everybody, yeah, let's celebrate this with dark and drowning, keep your distance. And I forgotten what it feels like to leave the room and think it's okay to walk away. I know I'm probably overstepping. You hate when I'm needy, but where's your loyalty, babe? So, so good. So good. Thank you. Thank y'all. I really love that me. explanation that you did because now I, I really get the importance of that. I've forgotten what it feels like to leave the room and think it's okay to walk away. Like, what a what an interesting um, way to phrase what is effectively feelings of jealousy, insecurity, suspicion, all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff gets wrapped up in... And just the simple act of just like walking away somewhere and not having it be a thing of like, oh, really? Should I? Am I? Am I okay to do this? That's that's amazing. Thank um, you. I wanted to point out, if you don't mind, and just because I want to talk on music for a little bit, because I know we have people who probably want to know about my 
my take. People want to know my take. Weird. Um, <laughs> they but, do. You know, talk about music beyond just lyrics. So if you wouldn't mind pulling up the lyrics, I'm so sorry. Yeah. We have to cover up your face every time. Oh, <laughs> listen, that's, the, that's, the, my that, that, that's probably, we'll see, if I look at the metrics, we'll see the viewership go up when I uh, bring this over my face. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, and without playing this song a billion times, but I will lead you through the verse here. So we have our younger than, we have all our positive lyrics. We have all our positive setup in the first verse here. Younger than, we're setting a scene, we're young, we're making minimum rent, we're, we're you know, let's have a party. The phrases melodically are all going up at the end. Younger than, oh. 2010, leaning on your car, and we dip down a little bit there, but making and paying rent. Yeah. You work so hard. And then we keep going up. This technically could be a pre chorus. Let's have a party. Invite everybody. Yeah, let's celebrate this. And then when we go back down, we're intentionally going back down for dark rum drown and keep your distance. Oh, wow. So we end low there. Um, when you bring your melodies up, or at least your, you know, like your line endings up, it gives a sense of you know, leading into something. But in this case, it gives a sense of like positivity, like we're having fun, we're, we're going up there and we're going yeah. up in, um, I, don't, I wish I knew the scale. I'm not very like theory oriented, uh, um, but uh, we're uh, keeping it very light and the melody is very light and floating upward until we get to this line that's drowning, keep your distance. And it's we a fourth. bring the melody so back down. Go okay, da, 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 da. Yeah, it's a fourth. I'm, I'm da, da, plunking da, da. out on the Ooh, fourth, sir. Fourths are great for that just um, very happy. Uh, it's like fourths and ninths feel like floating. Mm. And I don't know if that's just me. I, there is a there is a universal explanation to this. And again, theory is like, oh my God, not my thing. <laughs> but it has a quality to it that is understood by the ear to be sort of like this floaty, positive happiness. There's tension, but good tension. Um, in the interval when you play it at the same time, when you go between those notes and when you play like a one to a four chord, all of that feels very soft and good and enjoyable on the ear. So we're doing this with the melody melody and then we come back down for that line where the lyric is also like coming down. <laughs> we're like deflating that sense of happiness by the time we get to that lyric, keep your distance. And one final thing and then I will stop belaboring the song, but the first verse has that staccato movement that you were talking about, Ryan. It's very yeah. staccato. It's very like short phrases. We're just bopping along. Life is fast and happy and good. And then the chorus, we contrast that with longer phrases and more sort of a legato with its uh, being okay. sung. You so do one something. Of the things... Oh, go ahead. No, go... No, let me stop you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say something that is always helpful with writing is how can I create contrast between the different sections of my song? How can I make sure that my verses contrast from my choruses um, so that it's clear to anybody listening that, okay, I'm in a verse here and now I've moved into a chorus. I can mm. tell because they sound like different parts of the same song. Mm. Um, uh, one thing, I don't want to forget the thing I was about to say, so I'm going to, this is me making a mental note to come back, but, but uh, one thing you related to what you just said. I know another songwriter I've spoken to talks about, um, she was giving advice uh, to someone um, listening to their song and giving advice. And uh, her advice was, you're, you're jumping big intervals too soon. Save that for the chorus. It was this mm. idea that like in the verse, you can kind of keep your melodic movement relatively understated so that when you get to the chorus, you can do more dramatic kind of interval leaps. And it, it helps the listener understand this is sort of the um, uh, an emotional high point. This is the chorus. This is the catchy thing. Like it, it, and if you do too much of that too soon, even if it's different notes you're doing, but if you're you know if you're doing that kind of st those tricks, if you will, um, or methods in the verse, you, you're sort of losing its impact for the uh, for the verse. So it's interesting to hear you've got a similar sort of thought process here that all this stuff is happening. All these decisions are not by accident. It's not that you sat down, wrote a melody, and then after the fact went, oh, look, that's interesting. I'm kind of going up here, and then I'm going down here. Like that, that it's actually a, a conscious tool of the songwriter. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm yeah, and, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. You. You're spot on with that. Like, yeah, that advice is, is great, and you could even do the opposite. You could do big mm. verses and a down chorus, quiet mm, chorus, okay. um, and you sort of pay attention to that contrast between sections. You can create those moments of energy where you want them to be. Gotcha. Um, yeah, totally. Um, so there was something I was going to bring up here um, on the, this lyric sheet. Um, 
you do something in this song that you do in the moves song that um, I'm <laughs> based on two data points only. I'm going to call it a Sarah Spencer stylistic thing. And that is that you are like, you're wrapping the, you're wrapping the lyric. You're, how do I describe this? You're the line break for the lyric and the melodic line are not the same. It's so you've got um, younger than 2010 leaning on your car, making Macon comes actually at the end of the second line's melody rather than saving it going, make it minimum. You know, does that make sense? You're like, it's sort of this, yeah. you kind of yeah. wrapped it over it. It, it. Like it comes up earlier than it should. And you do the same thing in moves when you uh, sang, um, is it the truth or are you making moves? Did you read the room? Yep. So it's that same thing. You've moved. Did you read the room? You've moved did up to the line before and the, and the melody from the line before. So it's interesting. Is that, uh, is that something you do? Like I said, I've only got two data points now, but I'm going to assume now based on that, you do it in 100% of the songs you write, but that's probably not Every true. single one, every time, <laughs> every line. No, <laughs> that's, that's cool that you've observed that. Um, now that I'm thinking about it too, that is, I think, a product of just, I mean, I hate to be like, eh, it's just style, but like how other people can use that, that is sort of like, Okay, typically what we're taught is like have your line be a complete thought or have your one, two, like your couplet be yes. a complete thought. Line right. one, line two, period, end of sentence, right? Um, that's like a rule, if you will. Sure. <laughs> but you can break rules. Like if it sounds interesting, if it shakes things up, if it adds energy, if it has flow, um, you can break those rules and do it in purposeful, meaningful ways. Um, sometimes I'll do that so I can rhyme and I, I don't know if I've done it in this song. Making, leaning on your car, making. Yeah, 2010 and making, they don't, they're kind of slant rhymes, but when I sing it, I make them rhyme. Um, so again, just, I, I did that purposefully because my ear wanted to hear it. I don't think I literally wrote it. Like, I'm going to have this not be a complete thought and I'm going to carry mm. that word, you know, down into the next line or whatever. I don't think I did that purposely, but I was looking for rhythm and a rhyme there. Like I knew my ear wanted to hear something there that would do that. And I think that's probably why that making is sort of that little pickup line, gotcha. that little pickup word for the next line. I hope that helps anybody who may be wondering about yeah it's you cool know, breaking just, rules <laughs> yeah exactly it's cool I, I like it i liked it when you did it in moves i liked it when you did it here um and it's something maybe i'll uh try and do it myself and see if it actually makes for an interesting result as well um, i think another sorry one more point about that i think a quality of when you do that in a song i think it gives a quality of don't hang up the phone yet keep listening because mm, we're not done talking mm. um which if you're writing pop music or commercial music you know you've probably heard all of the tropes and cliches about pop music don't bore us get to the chorus make it happen fast right. like keep people's attention etc so to sort of have a little pickup word like that it gives that energy of like keep listening there's more coming right interesting i'll even now i'm gonna and i'm gonna go into like you know 11th grade english class um interpretation here but i'll even say that sort of knowing what the song's about and sort of where it goes it has a quality in a way of like this the staggered delivery of someone who's sort of hyperventilating or or upset mm -hmm. about something and sometimes the the words don't come out in the right in the normal spoken cadence or the normal in this case sung cadence you know there's, there's a sort of disjointed nature to that so it sort of sets up a little it might be dare i say again 11th grade english it's the first indication maybe that things aren't going exactly as they should in the song you know so cool i love that that's that's great <laughs> thank you <laughs> make me sound like real good that's awesome <laughs> cool well um okay so now you you lead the way here um you have um are we going further into this song do you have a finished version of this song or is there another song we're looking at or what are you that's what i've got for for this song cool. um if you guys want to jump into something else i can show you i promise a much more rough recording because it is from the old 
Perfect. The old iPhone. I, I um, mean, I, listen, don't don't get our, our joking wrong. We It sounds fantastic and we love it. It's just that you. we all wish that we could make uh, demos that sound like that because I, I don't have, I was almost going to out of solidarity play you some of my own demos, but I don't have my phone within arm's length, so I, I can't actually do it. So, um, All good. But, I would uh, love to hear some time though. <laughs> okay, I'm going to send you this. I'm sending you another Google Doc with some lyrics. Oh, Thank cool. you so much for doing this. If there's another way you want me to send you these. No, this is working. It's it's fine. It's, you know. <laughs> it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's a live stream. It's can't we can't be all graceful in our execution here. <laughs> for I mean, nobody would know this, but you guys like Ryan and I had a call last week where Ryan helped me set up all my tech here and he was literally like in reason showing me what you know how to set my compressor and my maximizer and all this stuff like totally getting me set up on this end because I am not <laughs> like I don't I don't know the first thing about live streaming so while this, I'm uh, while I'm getting the setup actually um why don't you so you you're saying you were a reason user from a long time ago but you said to me and I'm curious to um just explore this with you for a second that you yeah. don't consider yourself a producer as it were, except that if anyone follows Sarah on Instagram and it's Sarah Spencer music at Sarah Spencer music on Instagram, um, she'll post stories and stuff with reason files and you're very much, a, you know, you got a lot of stuff going on. You got like, they're very much look like fully produced reason sessions to me. So is that a new Thank thing you. that you're getting into the technical uh, production part? Yeah. Absolutely. During the pandemic, that was like one of my two pandemic hobbies. The first one was oil painting. And the second one was I'm finally going to learn how to record my own music at like a high level. So oh, I'm fun. not I'm not a total producer who's been doing it for years. Um, like I said, my dad had his home studio when I was growing up. So I, I got to use everything that he had. But when I went away to college and started focusing on design and stuff, I sort of fell out of all of that. And then right. and picked up a guitar. I learned guitar before I moved to Nashville. Not well, but like songwriter guitar. And um, so that kind of took my focus for a while. And then been here for many years when the pandemic hit, I was like, you know what? I'm really, really feeling the urge to just record i wanted to record piano instrumentals because it's one of the first things i started writing ever and i was like reason was so much fun like i just <laughs> want to get back into reason it's so easy to just dive in and record and get your ideas down which is totally my pace <laughs> like right, i just need right. to be able to dive in and do it um so yeah i picked up reason after that and now i'm trying to teach myself pop production so let me just check fun. in with a couple of comments <laughs> while and i got the the lyrics yeah. here ready to go but um uh, L.A. Winter says, um, it seems to me like your process puts how it sounds first and making sense second uh, for what order you like writing parts in. I don't know if you uh, would agree with that or not, but that's their observation. That's so funny. I love that. Um, how it sounds versus making sense. The thing with with writing is that you can come back to it. If something's mm. bothering you or not making sense, you can totally come back to it. What I like to encourage people to do is to not sit in that mire of this isn't good enough, so I'm not yeah. even going to write it down, you know? I will tell you that is for me and I've come to understand that, you know, I, I like that you I like that you almost don't allow us to use the word writer's block, you know? You sort of you sort of took that one off the table because I think we all use that term and and you were saying it's not a it's not as big a, not that it's not a big thing, but it's it's not the impediment that you think it has to be, which I think is a great way to sort of yeah. take away uh, almost a, the the excuse for. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about other people. But for me, it's like when you said that, I was like, shit, I can't. You can't use that excuse. Oh well, then I guess I have to write songs. I can't. Uh, I can't just say I have writer's block. <laughs> but um, yeah. but what the one thing I've learned from talking with people and sort of the shared experience of writer's block is that. The, the thing that gets in your way in the early stages of writing is when you feel the pressure of the finished idea, when the, the finished result, an opinion of the finished result enters the room during the early ideation, <laughs> it, it kills it because you're, how can you make any choice without fearing that you're harming the, the finished result you think you're capable of, or you think it has the potential to be, you know what I mean? Like the, my... My greatest songs are the ones that I have not nearly finished because I don't dare because then they won't be my greatest songs, if that makes sense. Oh, my God. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. The procrastination is real. Like, it's real. It's all fear. Um, 
I, I'll point y'all to this book. I wish I had, it's in one of my, oh no, it's right on top. It's on top of the doom pile. Can <laughs> I can't reach it. I can't reach it without unplugging my headphones, but oh, okay. <laughs> it's called The War of Art by Stephen oh. Pressfield. And if you haven't read it, grab it. If you haven't read any books on creativity or art making, let this be the first one. And I'll admit he's a little harsh. He's a little tough in the writing. He's, he's kind of, you know, he don't, he don't take any BS from anyone. Uh, this is the style of writing, but it's a small book. It's a quick read. It's very conversational. And Stephen Pressfield talks about resistance as the resistance with a capital R okay. as the like thing that is always working against us. He kind of personifies resistance throughout the book and mm. resistance is all of these mechanisms, mechanisms that we're familiar with writers but there it is yes, pull up here the War of art. yeah yes get it go get it run go get it and get a paper copy so you can highlight it and make notes and things like that i've read this book i think i'm reading it for a third time now and every time i go through it every you know year or two that i'm reading something i find something different as i've just grown as a writer interesting um but resistance with a capital R is writer's block. It is perfectionism. It is um, imposter syndrome. All of these things are just sort of different facets of fear. Mm. Fear that we won't, you know, be good enough or that we won't add up or that we are not contributing, that we are, you know, whatever it may be right. that is that, you know, is filling that gap for us. Um I forgot where I was taking this, but oh, the pressure of the finished song. That is yeah. such a great way to put it. We do see that. We're looking down the road and we're like, oh my God, I see the potential of what I could be and what this song could be. And we identify with it and we say, oh my God, if this song isn't good, then I'm not a good writer. And I'm, I'm, I might as well just stop and we'll talk ourselves out of it. Yeah, I can't tell you when I was right, working Sarah. with, that's right? How it feels. You know? <laughs> yes. I no, know, that's true. how it feels. It's I true. go through it too. Yeah. Like it can totally feel like that sometimes. I remember when I was working with Steve, like people would casually say to me, it's like a, like a teenage girl, like who doesn't play guitar. People would be like, yeah, Steve makes me he's so good. He makes me want to just put down the guitar. <laughs> I'm like, I get it. That's funny. Yeah. But like, it's very real at the same time. Mm. So back, very long answer, but I'm very passionate about this. Circling back to, um, oh my God, my brain, the process yeah. versus the product. You are allowed to enjoy the process, even if the product you don't wind up enjoying. Like, that's okay. Wow. You're allowed to sit down and in, write music and enjoy writing music and exercise that part of your brain and see what you come up with and still write a crappy song. Like that it's, is it's totally good. That is, an, um, I'm going to think on that one more than once when I'm writing because for me, it almost feels like I've accepted that the process. I'm going to hate. The process is just a slog of tedious, <laughs> bad rhymes, cliche lines, and eventually arriving at something that I can sort of stomach enough to get to the finished process. But I sort of tolerate my, my, my not loving the process so that I can arrive at a product. But you're, I like the idea that I can flip that and say, even if I don't like the product, I can enjoy the process. That is a whole that's a whole inversion on my way of thinking. And my God, I hope I can do that because I would much rather, um, you know, it's like the, I, have you seen the Ira glass? Um, uh, he's got Ira glass from this American life. He's got this quote about, um, people in the creative process and how do you get over, um, the initial, I don't know how to describe it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase it uh, because you're you're making a note with your hand like you haven't seen it. So uh, like no, I, yeah, I want to write it down so I remember. Okay, it. it is a great quote. So here's I'm gonna do a bad paraphrase and then I'll, afterwards I'll send you the real thing. Ira Glass was asked about, in the actual just the writing. Like he's a writer, so just the regular writing process. How do you how do you get good at it? How do you do it? And his advice is just do it. Just write, 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 write. And because he said what happens in the very beginning, the thing that gets you into wanting to write is you have great taste. You know what you like. You, you, you know good writing when you see it, you know bad writing when you don't see it. And so you've got this really refined sense of taste. So much so that you decide to put your hat in the ring and do it yourself. But the problem in the very beginning is that there is a disconnect between 
the taste that you have so well refined and your ability. So your taste is able to tell you that you're not as good as you should be because it's like, this is developed, this isn't. And the only way to close that gap is to just do it over and over and over again. And so what you just talked about with enjoying the process, even if you don't have to enjoy the product is giving yourself permission to throw out all this stuff and just let the process and the enjoyment of the process eventually lift the boat without feeling like you could, once you get up to here, you don't have to say I've written 400 songs if you've thrown out 398 of them, you know, it's, it's, that's okay. You know, whereas I think, like I said, you know, I've, I've written a, songs I could count on one hand is because I'm keeping them all. And I have that feeling of like, they're all a product and I have to, they have to be, I can't write a song that I only for the process of it. It's uh so anyway, light bulbs going the off there. I yeah, will, uh, I've heard that quote before. I didn't know that was attributed to Ira Glass. That's awesome. Yes. Taste versus expectation. And what bridges that gap, like you were saying, is is writing. It's experience and skill. And you right. can learn those things. You can gain that on your own. It's it's not up to the universe to endow you with it. It's not something you're born with. You can bridge that gap yourself through just experience and skill. Right, right. And Francois uh, says as well, yes, you have to make mistakes to create. Yes. Uh, I, that yes, is, that is true. Francois. That's it. <laughs> you, got some, you got some snaps on that one, Francois. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Broke okay. my camera. There we go. <laughs> I have. Uh, oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um. I have the next lyric sheet up here. So. Um, oh yeah. Do you want me to throw it on screen and you can kind of set us up for what we're. Very looking sure. At. So this is a co-write here with two of my best friends. I love them so much. This is Sam Gyllenhaal and John Cirillo. I adore them. I write with them as often as I can. And um, so this is the final lyric sheet. I tried to find the original lyric sheet. I couldn't, but I'll just tell you a story about the song. So this is three people in a room with guitars. Um, we're all friends. We've written together many times at this point, and we just want to write something that is very good, very contemporary. Very, we also always sit down to write something that's very good, right? But <laughs> contemporary um, country pop and maybe potentially for Sam to record because Sam is in a band. He has the Sam Gyllenhaal band. You guys should totally check it out. They're incredible. Um, there's three of them. They do three part harmony and they're just like insane. Absolutely insane. The songs are so good. Um, so we kind of knew Sam's vibe at this point. And we also knew that we, well, how did we know what we were doing? Cause we just literally got into the room. We were like, yeah, we're going to write a song today. We love writing with each other. Like, let's see what we come up with. And we kind of collectively were like, well, what are you feeling? You know, what, what are, what vibe are you in? What energy are you in right now? And we were all feeling like, yeah, let's do something up tempo. Let's do something that um, is positive and upbeat and feels good and is just contemporary, feel good music. And that's very Sam. Sam's um, like endlessly positive and optimistic. That is totally reflected in his music. So, and I'm I'm saying these things, I'm telling you this so you can kind of maybe get a glimpse into a co-writing situation and also co-writing with and for an artist. Um, so if you're producers and you find yourself in a room with an artist and you're going to be writing a song together that way, I always find that it's really helpful to ask that artist, like, well, you're going to do like small talk. Small talk is great because you can kind of see how somebody's feeling that day. Um, if that artist in particular is maybe going through something and that's all they can think about and they want to write about that and they want to write about that with you like that's going to be where the energy is and that's always a good place to start because you're going to be the both of you are going to be invested in the song um so with this song in particular we were a little less you know targeted with it we thought maybe sam will record it maybe not but we all want to do up tempo so let's write something positive and up tempo today so this song is definitely more in the vein of like contemporary country pop like we, we are thinking Nashville radio. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, so I can play the work tape for you. I'll probably just play the work tape for you before I go into any of the lyric. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. But this is, this is me and Sam singing in the room. Uh, we just wrote the song, so we're literally both still learning it. And you'll hear that. Like, we're kind of finding our way through it. And two singers together harmonizing stuff like we're trying to figure it out so this is like a true blue work tape cool <laughs> oh and the song is called 
used to you at this point the song is called used to you so you'll hear that in the in the work tape cool that's sam playing heard the hook there used to you instead of fall into you yeah um sorry were you gonna say something ryan um so used to you why did we change it from used to you to fall into you um personally i still really like used to you i think that's a fun way to say I could get used to you. I could get used to this. I felt like it fit the vibe. It was very flirty, kind of sexy, really cute, you know, just way of saying it. I thought we played yeah. this song for, <laughs> yeah. I'm I thinking about it. Cause like, I like the the contrast normally get used to you. Sounds like something like resignation. Like I could, all right, I'll get used to you. Mm -hmm. But the idea of it, using it in a positive context of like, I, I'm going to get used to you. Like, I, I like that. Exactly. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Wait, does Sam make you change it? Sam, what, what do you do? No. Oh. So we, Sam and John and I were all like, yeah, we like this hook better. Like we were kind of, we were kind of voting for used to you. We played it for a few different people to get their take on it. Cause we, to be fully honest, we wrote this song and we were like, oh my God, I love this. I still love this song. It's one of my favorites. Mm. Um, so we were real proud of it and we played it around to publisher friends, other songwriter friends, just to get input from the, the community, from the industry side of the music world, um, to see what their thoughts were. How viable is this? What would you change? Is there anything that, you know, you yeah. see could stop this song from getting cut? Would you pitch it kind of thing? And, um, one of our friends, I don't remember who it was, but I, I remember it was a publisher he was like, yeah, used to you. I'm, you know, I don't really think that that's it. Let's try something more visual. And we we landed on fall into you as being the more visual thing, which is, I think, is slightly more visual. But like I said, I'm partial to used to you. Well, what I but, think is uh, interesting is that um, and, and it's interesting that that came from a publisher uh, as their opinion, because um, as a title in isolation, as a title, fall into you is a more compelling title than used to you. Um, but in context, and for the reasons I sort of mentioned, the contrast of the connotation of used to you as it's normally used and how, how you're using it, it's more interesting. But like if if I'm a publisher and I, you know, I mean, sometimes um, sometimes people are judging songs they may review or not review on title alone. You know, they might just look at a list of 30 songs and they might be like, oh, what are these ones? That sounds interesting. Let me check those out. And so that that makes sense that it comes via a publisher, too. <laughs> it sounds like publisher feedback. Yeah, it's publisher uh, feedback, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Absolutely. Oftentimes, that's somebody's first introduction to a song is they, you know, they're, they're a publisher or A&R or something, and it comes across their desk, a lyric sheet or a right. file on an email or something, and they just SoundCloud or, playlist, they just see the title. Right. I was going to say, even like, you know, I'm we're talking sort of the inside baseball industry thing, but nowadays we also have to think of like, you know, Spotify makes these curated playlists. And like, if you're looking at a, a 50 song curated Spotify playlist, like sometimes the title will jump out at you and you might check it out in a way that you might look overlook it if you don't. So it's not even, yes. it's not even just publishers that you have to think about now. It's like, you know, in, in, in the previous, you didn't see the songs that were coming up on the radio when you used to listen to radio, but now you can actually see, but based on title alone, what's coming up on your playlist. So it, it's yeah. probably a bigger factor now than ever before. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you're totally right. It's not just industry folks. It's yeah. listeners too. Totally. I, I Honestly, I think that's how like some songs you get. What is it like? Good for you. Olivia Rodrigo. She, it's good 
like number four U. Yeah. Or good for letter U or something. Right. I think that's fully intentional. I don't think that's just, you know, the way Olivia types. I mean, maybe <laughs> a little bit, but right. I think that's fully intentional for playlisting purposes and things like that. So yeah, totally. Totally something to think about. Um, so this song, um, Sam actually went on to cut. He went on to record it, and a cut is what you call, like just for anyone who doesn't know, a cut is like when the artist records your song and puts it on their album. Um, it comes from back in the day where they used to cut records, like actually, you know, make the yeah. grooves in the records. Needle cutting plates, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Sam actually recorded it. I don't think they have vinyl, but it's definitely on all the streaming platforms. You should go listen to it. Um, oh. I would play it, but I don't want to get us copyright flat. <laughs> I feel like that would be such a wonderful transition to like end this. Like, here's the final recording, but I don't want to get us in trouble <laughs> the here. Screen goes blank. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> boy, I almost, I almost want to. I wonder you what can, is is he? What is he? Uh, what label is he on? Is he signed to a? Is it a major? They're not or? with the label. They. I. I think YouTube said they distributed with like CD Baby. So I'm. I feel I like wonder, they're probably they probably it would are strike. On, yeah, it would strike from content ID if that's the case. Okay, yeah. we won't play it. Okay, so, but everybody, Sam listen. Gyllenhaal band. <laughs> yeah, Sam Gyllenhaal band. Everybody, go listen to the uh, <laughs> the finished version of "Fall Into You," um, mm. and then when the chorus comes, sing in, in your mind "Used to You" and uh, "Used to You." Yeah, <laughs> and if you want, we can take a look at those lyrics again. Yeah, I think there are a few points that I can make to help y'all, and you let me know how I see the time. But you let me know if we need. Oh, to I'll tell you, I'll, I'll flip that around on you. You also let me know as well because you know. I I will uh, I think every time I've ever done a live stream I selfishly keep everyone longer than uh, I meant to so at some point out of um, out of sympathy uh, I will I'll cut us off but <laughs> but you give me give me like a little wink if you're like I'm done Ryan like end this <laughs> no it's all good I honestly didn't know I assumed it would be an hour or two hours so like I'm I'm yeah. here honestly, the answer to those good. choices is yes a joy <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so with the song in particular, I wanted to play you guys this because it's kind of the opposite of the first one I showed you. The first song, Loyalty, is literally just me writing for me. Uh, it's it's an exercise and it's also to help me just like feel things and, and process things and be in music myself. I was the only person that had to like Loyalty, right? With this song, we're in a co-write. Not only do my co-writers have to like it, but also hopefully maybe the artist. Also hopefully maybe Sam who would eventually maybe cut it. Um, and also, hopefully, maybe anybody else along the line who would be, you know, a determining factor in the success of the song. So, you know, anybody that Sam is pitching it for. I know that Sam's band plays a lot out. They're great live. So that's a factor. Where can we put these, you know, rich harmony moments? Mm. Things like that. So thinking down the line about how this song is going to be used. Um, that's helpful if you are like professional minded if you are you know if you have aspirations to make music professionally or even to just get on stage if you've never done that before think about down the line how this song is going to be utilized um, and that'll help you with the writing so something that we really did in this song knowing that we're thinking like live performance country radio like country music is still a real radio heavy like genre they rely a lot on radio play um, we're think we're really leading into like our Nashville songwriting here with just image, 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 mm. imagery. Mm. People call it furniture here. Furniture is like that. Um, golly, how do I even describe it? It's it's images essentially. It's that that good uh, sensory language that you can see, taste, feel, hear, smell, all of that good stuff. So we have a lyric here spin a little Motown. There's two bits of sensory language just in the first four lines, spin and Motown. If you've ever um, read any Pat Patterson or listened to Pat Patterson or gone to yes. a workshop or anything like that. Yeah, yes. yes. Pat I've got fan. I've got the Pat Patterson library on the shelf right back there. Yes. Yeah. Not that it's done me any good, it. but I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> I find that the books are like, I use them like reference books. I try to read them top down, but like, I reference them. 
but I had the, oh my God, the blessing to be able to go to one of his workshops. Wow. And he's, he's an incredible speaker. If you ever get teacher, if you ever get the chance to go see one of his workshops, do it. It is worth yeah, it. Yeah. For people um, that may not know, Pep, he was, a uh, or is, I guess, um, one of the instructors at Berkeley teaching songwriting, but he's sort of, his claim to fame is that, you know, songwriters that have passed through his school of thought, the John Mayers, the um, Gillian Welch's, you know, there's some sort of major uh, songwriters that have, that are protégés of the pat patterson style so yeah yeah but it is his he thing has, is that that sensory language certainly is kind yeah. of his shtick right yes show don't tell so that's what we're trying to do here is show rather than tell and pat patterson's thing is like show people what is happening in the story as though they're watching like a movie show them what's going on in front of them rather than telling them how you feel about it um so and there's reasons for that um, brain. Okay, but yeah, spin a little Motown. So the spin is a sensory language. We know that we have five senses, right? Right, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Some, some of us have six. But <laughs> the spin is a kinesthetic sense. And this is something that I learned from Pat. Kinesthetic is how your body feels in space. Mm. So like if you're dizzy, that's a kinesthetic sensation. Um, upside down things like that. When you use sensory language, what happens in your brain is, is you feel it or see it or smell it, whatever that sense is, mm. you're going to recall that in your own mind instantly and a lot faster than you would if you were just reading something. Um, words that have, you know, like, let's see, where's a word that I can just use as an example? Red wine, paper cup, Friday that phrase is not a it's not a full sentence right it's not like we're speaking to somebody conversationally and saying hey let's go have a red wine paper cup friday like no <laughs> one says that but it's rapid fire imagery <clears throat> and we right. know what red wine is you know what red wine tastes like you're also going to have your own subjective connotation with like ew i like red or ew i don't like red wine or oh my god yes i love red wine like right. this is my favorite cab or whatever you're going to pull up all of this information in in the files of your mind just based on those two words, red wine. Um, and red wine, paper cup Friday, this is just sort of a Nashville thing. I, I kind of attribute it to like Florida Georgia line, per probably being the people that started this first where they just have like rapid fire shotgun furniture throughout their songs. Right. They're just like visual, visual, bam, bam, bam. This is actually um, the thing that if people know, uh, Bo Burnham did a sort of parody of I think this <laughs> style of uh, not exactly this, but the the concept of like furniture and kind of making these references. I think he was directly parroting their what they sort of did with what you're saying that sort of rapid fire uh, imagery thing. So yes, it's totally recognizable. Like you can totally tell, probably a song that was written probably in Nashville. If you see this type of style, rapid fire furniture like that, and it's like very commercial and very in right now. One of my favorite writers that does this really well is Hardy. Listen to his music. He's an incredible writer, incredible mm. singer. But he and he does, you know, more than this isn't his only shtick. He's just an amazing writer. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the technique that we're using here in the first verse. We want to rapid fire, give people a bunch of imagery so you can sort of paint this scene in your mind of what's going down and and all the sensory sensations that you get from um, from these lyrics. Your lips, my skin, heating up, giving in. And we're keeping it very flirty too. We're kind of, we're keeping a little bit of flirty, you know, sexy, like, hey, come inside kind of vibe as well. Three, two, one, yeah, we're taking off. Like literally a countdown. Those, those are numbers. <laughs> they're not words, they're numbers. Um, so just trying to like give that immediacy of lots of furniture, lots of visual, lots of sens lots of sensory language for this. Right. Um, I think that's why I love this song. I, it's, it's just fun for me to listen to. And Sam is the melody guy on this song. Sam always comes to our co-writes with the melody. So we use his melody. It's fantastic. Um, and yeah. So when he came to you, can I ask with, the, with that melody, he had what? He just had like hum and a hum and a la 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 kind of filler mumbles and you found... Pretty much. Okay. Um, that is something I find I do it because of course, of, of course I don't come to a melody with a finished lyric already, but I often find it mystifying how the, how words find their way into a mumble. Like it, it's like 
out of the ether. It's like it's a mumble, it's a mumble, and then suddenly like, oh, no, there's a word there. And, oh, now there's three words next to it. Like, And I've watched, and anyone uh, watching this should check out on Sarah on her uh, at Sarah Spencer music Instagram, she'll do these live right streams. And that was what I first found so interesting about them is that you, you start out with your, your song club people and you start doing a, you've got, you know, maybe a, a song prompt and then you've got a mumble and then like, it's just out of nowhere. Suddenly it's like, Oh, Hey, wait, Oh, that mumble morphed into having lyrics. What is the, is there a trick to making that happen? Or is it just divine uh, manifestation that causes a mumble to suddenly get a lyric that feels like it's, exactly what belonged to be there yeah great question honestly the key to that is just letting go mm. and and it's it's again that settling into the moment allowing yourself to meet yourself where you are with your skill level where it is whatever that may be and just say you know what i i'm writing right now and i'm gonna let it come out whatever it may be don't let resistance stop you huh. um with the mumbling specifically for me like I, I just think that I've been writing that way for so long. Like, that's just how I like to write. I like to write lyrics and music at the same time. We said that a little yeah. a few minutes ago. Right. So to me, that's what that looks like, writing music and lyrics at the same time. I'm sort of humming. I've been a singer. This is my primary instrument is my singing voice. So I'm, I'm always using that as a reference point. Um, and going there because I'm I'm most familiar with playing this instrument <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than playing anything else. So... And, and something else to learn about songwriting, if you don't know already, is is look into phrasing, what phrasing is. Phrasing is like flow. It's like how your lyrics and your melody lock together in a way that sounds natural or in a way that sounds interesting. Um, like we could say, oh, what's an example? I'm trying to like come up with an example of like bad phrasing. I don't, I don't really even know if bad phrasing exists, to be honest, because it's it's just the way that things lock in together. Mm. So when I'm mumbling, what I'm doing is searching around for a, you know, a melody that might sound pleasing or feel good in my voice. And then also what words have that melody? Because mm. when we're speaking, our speaking voices and our, our language has melody. It has ups and downs and, you know, tension and release and all of that stuff. So right. you can kind of listen to that too and say, okay, maybe there's words in here. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm going to throw this up again uh, and see if there's anything else we need to uh, mention about it. Um, well, one thing I'm curious to know is uh, the second verse. Um, I, this is, a, a, a again, a, a question I'm going to ask for my own sake, but I think others uh, think about this too. There is a, in the storytelling aspect of writing a song, there's a certain pacing uh, or development that needs to happen. You you have an idea that maybe sort of takes shape in the first verse. You then sort of encapsulate that into a kind of catchy conceptual thing for the chorus. And then suddenly you're, you're at the second verse and you're like, I got to either keep telling the story or I have to develop the story so that there's a reason for me to like. And I think a lot of times, um, and this is, again, my own experience, but also I haven't talked to others. In early songwriting, it, there's this feeling of like, but I've, I've kind of said what I need to say. Like, to take your previous example, it's like, well, I said I th thought maybe my boyfriend was cheating and now I kind of feel weird about it. Like, that's that's the idea for the <laughs> song. Like, how do I how do I develop that? So in looking at this second verse, how did you and how do you, I guess, as a more general rule, um, how do you keep an idea going so that there is a, a second or a third or, you know, a bridge, like all these things that need to go into sort of developing and pushing the story of the song forward. Yes, definitely. The second verse curse. <laughs> is <laughs> that a thing? The second verse and you're like, wow, yeah, it's totally a thing. Second oh, wow. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the fact that if, if, if you recognize that, that's awesome. Then you're off to your great start. You, you already say, oh, okay, I've kind of already said everything I needed to say and I'm only you know into the first chorus like now what it's good to recognize that um because you'll get better at it just as you keep writing and I'm using the collective you I'm not like talking to you <laughs> I, like, will, I will receive it as a me <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll help um but yeah the more you write and the more you're aware of that the easier it gets to kind of solve that before you run into that again but with this song specifically i'm glad you brought it up because we did kind of run into that a little bit three writers in a room together we still ran into that okay now where do we go 
um, the song itself is not this huge story with like deep emotional content, right? It's just right. fun. It's about having a good time at home on the patio with someone that you love. And like, that's, that's really it. All we have in the linear story is like, we start out outside and then we went inside. So like, what, where do we go from here? You'll see in the second verse, um, you and the harpy make a damn mess of me dizzy. Like I'm spinning in circles. You could be my sweet addiction. We're talking about now how, how you feel about that person. So in the first verse, we're talking about the setting, mm. you know, it's Friday, we're on the patio, bonfire, backyard, you know, we're together. Let's go where, where it's going to go. That's the setting. That's the vibe. That's the, the, the characters. And then the second verse, it's like, okay, now what do we talk about? There's, it's, it's not really that deep. Is it? There's not that much to say, but well, let's talk about how we feel like, or let's talk about how the narrator feels about this other person in their life. And again, using furniture to show how they feel rather mm. than just tell how they feel. So if we were telling, it would be like, man, I'm crazy about you. <laughs> and I think I love you. Like, it's just very plain, plain right. language. And there's nothing wrong with using plain language, but that's not what our aim was here. We wanted to use that good, good furniture and sensory language to really illustrate how we felt. Um, so the narrator, you and that heartbeat, you make a damn mess of me. That's probably the most conversational thing in here. You make a damn mess of me. Um, you make me feel dizzy, like I'm spinning in circles. Instead of saying, you make me feel like my heart is racing or saying you make me feel dizzy like i'm spinning in circles something visual you could be my sweet addiction and then let's move the show inside i guess we move inside by the second verse right add a little candlelight and you know we're gonna go off and have our private time together <laughs> uh but yeah if you're Let's... aware of the fact that you've run out of material by the time you're halfway through the song then that's that's a good step <laughs> halfway through forward. the first verse does that count too <laughs> it counts <laughs> <laughs> Um, halfway through the first line, sometimes I've run out of material by that point too. Um, I'm <laughs> um, I the second verse also it's worth um, pointing out to people. I think um, again talking about the sensory language and the way that you're um, making it a point to reference as many senses as possible. So you and that heartbeat that is a um, well, it's two two things. I mean I get the uh, there's the the sound and the feeling of the actual like you know head on the chest kind of the the sound of the heartbeat uh, or the feeling of the, the thump. Um, and then dizzy, like I'm spinning, obviously sensory, um, sweet addiction, not just you could be my addiction, but my sweet addiction. So there's actually a, a taste sense in there. Um, add a little candlelight. You've got now we're, we're talking about literally the, the, the lumens in the room, the amount of like lumens in the room or the, the smell of the candle, uh, burning or the match being lit, the, the heat off the candle. Yeah. We can make a habit of burning again, you know, heat as a, as a sense. So it's, it's in every single line there. And I, I imagine that's not by accident. Um, but I point it out for people um, because in your own writing, um, I think that's one of the things that I, because I, I, I'm even aware of that sort of concept of sensory writing and, and um, what um, Pat Pat's books and how much he sort of is a, a proponent of that. I still find it hard to put into my own writing. Like sometimes I'll write a lyric and I'll be like, there's no sense in here. How can I put a sense in here? Can I? And then I sort of just go like, I don't think I can. Okay, I'll just move on. But I, I feel like that's a cop out. I feel like... I, I could always, you know, and, and seeing Sweet Addiction, there's one of those ones where I go, ah, see, she she got one in there. And whereas I feel like I could easily <laughs> just be like, you could be my next addiction or you could be my big addiction or whatever. And I wouldn't think of that that's such an easy ad to put a sense in there. It's interesting. Yeah. You, I mean, just deconstructing that line right there. Yeah. That is a great way to look at your own lyric. If you want to put some more sensory information in there, you know, look at your lyric, uh, pull up any song that you've finished already or a draft. I'm sorry, not finished a song that you're working on. That's not finished. That's a draft and say, okay, maybe I can just swap out one word here and there with something that has an image or a sound or something sensory with it. And that's, that's an easy place to start. Can I swap a word here and there? Um, and something to say as well, there's nothing wrong with like not having a ton of sensory language. This is all sensory language. This lyric here, here is all sensory language. And we're going for that, like Nashville style songwriting, country music, ear candy lyric. Like that was our full intention with this song. So we right. went full throttle into it. Um, that doesn't have to be the way that you write everything. The thing to know about sensory language is that it hits the brain faster and with more impact. 
than with language that doesn't have sensory language. Interesting. Um, excuse me. And I'm not a neuroscientist. It's just something I've gleaned from, you know, reading and writing and all, all those things. Um, but you know, when you, when you read a word on the page, a bunch of things happen. You, you perceive the word, right? You see the word, the, the ups and downs of the words and the roundness of the letters, and you know the word and you probably maybe see the word in your head as well, depending on who you are. Um, and you're also going to perceive the, like the definition and the concept of that word. So if I say elephant, you may see the word elephant, but you're going to see an elephant in your head, right? right? Like you're going to have the visual, the elephant, and then you're also going to get the subjective connotation with the word elephant too. You know, you might see like Dumbo specifically, mm -hmm. or you might see the elephant that you met in Thailand when you went to the elephant sanctuary. It's going to be, you're going to have just those layers of understanding all in one word. And it's going to be a little bit universal, but also a little bit different for everybody who hears that word. So that's sort of like the lightning strike behind sensory language is that everybody can feel it and perceive it in their own mind and in their own bodies. Mm. We all know what it's like to touch uh, fire. We all know what it's like to, you know, put your hand through a flame of a candle. We know that it's hot. If you say the word hot, you know what hot is. But you're going to heat or you're going to feel hot, maybe like hot, like a hot day. It's 100 degrees outside. Or you're going to think of that candle that you burn yourself on. So... It's just a tool that you can utilize over and over again. Right. But anyway, long-winded answer, but yeah. A, a comment from um, a user, Shadow Grew a Body. Uh, he says, or she, cool. or, or they say, sure, draw inspiration from real life, but don't kid yourself. Most elements in pop music are not authentic and don't need to be to make a good song. Somewhat uh, maybe provocative uh, comment. I don't know. Do you, do you agree, disagree with uh, that sentiment that... Most it, elements sorry, of pop music. Pull it up again? Yeah, most elements. I'm sorry, he says, sure, draw inspiration from real life, but don't kid yourself. Most elements of pop music are not authentic and don't need to be to make a good song. I find myself disagreeing a little bit with the middle part and then agreeing with the last part. <laughs> where it's like, yeah, it's true. Yeah. They don't they don't need to be to make a good song. Um, yeah. But, but what do you think? In your own songwriting, would you say that uh, the stuff that you write has an element of authenticity to it, even if it's not personal, autobiographical? Um, yeah, I tend to like, I tend to always want to bring authenticity to anything I'm writing. I'm warm and fuzzy and mushy on the inside. So I like to, to build in connections with other people in my music because I know how powerful it is. And right. that's what draws me to music. And I like to give that back out. Um, but I know people who are here and they are churning and burning songs every day about trucks and mud and, and tailgates. And even though they're not necessarily <laughs> living that life right. themselves, right. Um, but maybe their co-writers are. So I, I th in a way, I think authenticity is hard to avoid. Mm. I feel like somebody's going to bring some of that into the room. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't always have to be deep. If right. That's what we're talking about. Pop music doesn't always have to be deep. It's totally okay to write a song about having fun. You reminded me of something. Um, I had an experience. I went to the, in when I was in Nashville, I went to the Country Music Hall of Fame and you know, they've got all these displays up, but then sort of in one of the central areas, they've got this little like video display loop that they play and people can kind of sit down and watch this little looping half hour of montage of stuff. And it's, you know, Buck Owens performances and Loretta Lynn and and all this stuff, and then on the um, on the montage comes up the Dukes of Hazards with Waylon Jennings uh, theme song, and everyone in the audience that was sitting there and sort of watching was like, yeah, oh yeah, you know, they, they all responded to it, <laughs> and I was really struck by it because it, I was like, I was sort of, I sort of wanted to say to everybody, you realize that. The stuff you've been passively watching and not responding to is the real stuff from the real country musicians. And now there's this like, you know, the the Hollywood that is so often derided by the same people that are now responding to this thing that was crafted in Hollywood as a like sort of crass imitation of Southern life. And it was just like, why, why are you, why are you cheering this thing? It's like why so inauthentic. It's not, you know, and then it went back to whatever, you know, just uh, flattened scrubs and they went back to just sitting and watching. And I was like, Oh man. I think that's so funny because what that response was, it was, it was, um, that music was accessible to them because mm. like you said, it's Hollywood. So 
they got a full dose of it. They grew up with it. They're familiar with it. It was accessible. Flat and Scruggs is not necessarily something that everybody gets exposed to or right, right. seeks out. You know what I mean? So right. people are going to always be nostalgic or, or recognize or identify with the things that they're familiar with. I mean, that's kind of a blanket statement. But just in terms of that story, sure. I just think that's interesting because those tourists – were familiar with that because it's it was accessible to them. They were, they were familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, that short. makes anyway. sense. That makes sense. A uh, comment from Starful. Um, I find it hard to actually come up with an idea in the first place because I'm always like, well, there's no subject that wasn't already a song made about it, um, mm -hmm. moving me uh, enough to then write about it. How do you, I mean, the two songs we've looked at here, you know, hanging out on a Friday night and drinking with friends and, uh, and feeling the insecurity in a relationship and, and suspecting maybe cheating. I mean, you know, is this in no way a critique of your two songs? Those are not top. You were not the first person to bring those topics to music. You know, those. Uh, Absolutely not. <laughs> and so how do you get over what, and I'll bring it up again. So what, what Starfool is saying, uh, um, sort of the audacity of like, well, let me, I'm going to give you my take on this topic that you've all heard about before. Yes. Starfool, have the audacity. Go for it. Like, you're totally right. Everything's been written about. Everything's been written about already. I can't tell you how many songs we've written about sitting on the patio with someone mm. you love. Like, that's something that we go to. Me, me and my co group of co-writers, we go right. to that over and over again. Um, yeah, everything's been written, but nobody's nobody's you. You're not writing those things. Right. I'm assuming you're saying because you get stuck in the beginning. Like, you, you, if you're not writing those things, and the world doesn't have that song that you wrote. So. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of a more eloquent way to say that, but you bring to the table something, I mean, so, so astoundingly unique. It could never be replicated. Mm. No one could be you. The same way that I, I flash back a little bit to my own past is just like being that little kid on stage with the microphone trying to sing Christina Aguilera, exactly like Christina Aguilera. I could never be her, no matter right. how hard I tried. And that's not the point. She's already out there. All those songs that are already written already exist and they fulfill their role. Those writers made that work and that is their work. So we want your work. We want your work next. And I guarantee you, if it moves you, if you're if you're even the slightest bit interested in writing about it, write about it. Do it. That That's that is your path forward. <laughs> you know, I'm I, what I thought of um, when I read that comment was um... – while, while you were talking to uh, Taylor Swift, shake it off. Like if, if she were using the star fool mindset, she would have thought oh, I'm going to write a song about like not caring what people are saying about me. Well, that's been done a million times. And so the idea would have and died on the vine right there. But yep. her take is unique on it because not everybody has, we've all had the experience of like, I'm just, Oh, I don't care what people are going to, say about me you know we've all had that moment but she then brings in this unique perspective of like coming at it from the the world eyes are on her you know and what mm -hmm. is the press saying what is the what is the twitter verse saying about her i go on too many dates that's what people say you know i got nothing in my brain that's what people say i mean all these things <laughs> yes. that's that's her unique take but to get to that unique take she had to get over the hump of just of not worrying if like other people have done the like don't worry what people say and um, what I think is interesting about that song is that none of us can relate to having, to being worldwide celebrities. And yet, because the core idea is relatable, by the time you get to the chorus, it becomes an anthem that everyone can uh, sort of co-opt and, and own. And, and then you get, you know, that's where you get a million TikTok people dancing to it and they're, they're singing along to lyrics that they really have no... You know, they, they've never been trending on Twitter with people saying things about them. They've never been followed by paparazzi and, and on DMZ. And yet the the concept is universal. And so they are able to relate to it. So Starful. Yeah. Amen. Just a <laughs> Snaps for Ryan. Snaps. Snaps. <laughs> cool. Well, let's run through a couple of other questions here. And then I'm going to let you go because I could, like I said, I, I could just leave you here all day. I could talk forever about I know. Too, I could so, talk forever yeah. too. But at some point I... I need to be mindful of uh, both of our days, <laughs> plus, uh, you know, good bladder control, all the things that would uh, go to hell if we just stay here all day. Bio so, <laughs> um, let's see. I've got a couple here that I flagged while we were going. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Joel, Joel Jerner, um, 
unless that's a European Joel Yerner. Um, oh. So apologies, Joel slash Yol, if I pronounce it wrong. Um, he says, uh, while I don't have full on writer's block, how do I stop loathing everything I write? Regardless of instrument, key, tempo, style, there's always something that makes it off-putting. Joel, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I also can relate a little bit to that myself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, what is the... What is the love yourself Sarah Spencer school of uh, <laughs> of of not loathing everything you write? Yeah, the word loathing. I'm just like, oh my gosh, loathing. I've been there. I've been there for many years. Like, I mean, not to talk about myself, but just to relate. But like, do talk it's about just <laughs> been. <laughs> talk about me. It's just been recently in like the past couple years that I I I remember thinking this. I remember thinking, oh my god. I'm actually writing stuff that I really like for the like hmm. and I've, I've liked a lot of songs that I've written over the years but like I really feel like I've finally written long enough and mm. written enough material to be to have the confidence to know that when I sit down to write something I can write what I need to exactly what I mean to and need to and again not measuring that by external standards not measuring that in product by how is it going to be received by other people mm -hmm. i know now that i can sit down and write a song that means a lot to me and honestly i can play it for other people because i'm like yo this is good <laughs> like, and you like keep writing to loathe songs like i've fully been there i think about being in school when i was studying graphic design and i and i was still writing songs but i didn't really love everything i was writing and mm. i have plenty songs that i'm just like oh this is real bad but i would encourage you to spend some time thinking about a what you want what you're envisioning for these songs and b how do i phrase this not identifying with the songs, not identifying your own worth with the song. Mm. Artists are separate from the art that we make. And I know it's controversial and I struggle with it too. Yeah. But we are not our work. We always tend to just over-identify with our work and think, man, following that train of thought, if you're over-identifying with your, with your work and then you make something that you is not good or is not well received you know mm -hmm. good in quotes is not well received by others or by yourself that's going to chip away at your own self-worth so you have to separate yourself from what you're creating and it's easier said than done and i wish i had really great advice on how to do that other than just every day knowing that what you're making does not make you less of a writer the songs that you're writing does not make you less of a writer. The songs that you're writing make you more of a writer, if anything, mm. because you're writing them. Even if you don't necessarily like them, I encourage you, Joel, to try and put it out of your mind that every song you write determines your worthiness to write. I hope that makes sense. That's um, a great, that's write, great advice. Yeah. Write some things that you enjoy. Like, seriously, go go listen to the music that you enjoy and then, like, say, what is it that I like about this? And then just start writing in that direction. And it may be right. scary and it may be hard, but you can do it. And, again, we're bridging that gap between taste – what is it? Taste and expectation or something? Taste yeah. and potential? Yeah, yeah. With, with skill and experience. You can do it. Just keep writing and be kind to yourself. Oh, my gosh. I just – I have so much, like – mushy love that i want to send your way because I, I know, know yeah that the, that the word loathing i i jumped on that too it's like that's a really that's not like how do i stop disliking everything no, loathing is like yeah you know that's i i feel that i i i i feel for you joel and um yeah like i this is easier said than done and i shouldn't be the one saying it so like, i wish that my advice to you was just like yeah don't do that <laughs> You know, don't love that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, we're here. We're here for you, Joel. Like seriously, like we both. We're both like, oh, I know what that feels like. Yes, You're not alone. Yes. Like we've we've all been in it. It's not just the two of us either. Like we've all, the, all writers have experienced that. There's an interview I read once uh, with Neil Young, and he talked about. He's got this song called Sugar Mountain, and it's a lot of these kind of just simple verses, like two, or like four line, short line stanzas, and so he wrote a bunch of them. Uh, for the song. And I guess he wrote more than are in the song. And one of the ones he wrote, um, he hated it. He wrote it and he was like, that is the dumbest thing. Maybe the dumbest thing I've ever written. It's certainly the dumbest one on the page. 
What garbage? And he was so struck by that loathing that you're talking about, Joel, that the, the strength, not it's not just that he dismissed it, he loathed that verse. And because of that, and because he recognized that, he deliberately made that one of the ones he put in the song because he he wanted to almost like, not punish himself, but like almost desensitize himself to the loathing, to sort of be like, mm. I, if I, if I, if this is the worst thing I've ever written, well, I'm putting it in the song and guess what? No one else is going to come up to me and be like, boy, that's a beautiful song, but that one, that one is maybe the worst thing you've ever written. No one's going to say that to him, you know? Yeah. So he deliberately put it in. And when I look at it, I don't, the, the, the line is now you're underneath the stairs and you're giving back some glares to the people that you met and it's your first cigarette. There's nothing particularly about that where I'm like, what garbage, Neil Young. Give it up, Neil Young, you know? Um, <laughs> stop, Neil Young. Stop, like, it's oh over. <laughs> it's okay. yeah. You know, so I thought, I found that interesting and also, you know, that, um, and, and maybe, Joel, you can take some solace in this, that uh, the, maybe those feelings, as much as you um, can't stop them, they're, they're happening to Neil Young as well. At the height of his career, that's, you know, Neil Young mm -hmm. circa whatever, 1974 or something like peak Neil Young, and he's still going through that as well. But his solution was to not, to actually like force it upon himself and embrace it rather than uh, run from it or or, or yeah. feel shame or, or self-loathing, so. That's a great idea. That's a great way to just make yourself do it. If you have writer's nights in your town and you're sitting on a bunch of songs and you're like, I don't know if these are any good, I'm kind of scared, go take them to a writer's night, go do an open mic. Right, right. <laughs> I will say, so I've, I've poked around on Song Club. Um, the community there is really supportive of each other. And when people post songs, you know, I have never seen someone post one of you guys. Well, you have a section. What's it called? Drafts, I think is what it's called in the. Yeah, drafts folder. Drafts yeah. folder where you can kind of put your stuff while it's in um, process and people can give advice or if you want it or they can give feedback if you want it or they reactions or whatever. And. It's like just universally uh, positive and universally helpful. There's the, the things that I, when I think about like putting a song into that drafts folder, the the inner critic goes like, oh boy, they, they'll really tear this one apart. But people aren't like, the people don't actually do that. It's your, no. it's only that inner voice that, that sort of fears that. So don't get me wrong too. I have to say that because a, a sort of a tenant of song club that I'm trying to bake in there is like, we're not going to be crude, rude and barbaric to you. If you post your music here, right. we are going to be encouraging. I love cheering artists on. And right. at the same time, like I'm going to give you constructive feedback because there's a difference between constructive criticism and just criticism. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. it's, it's how you deliver it. Um, so what I'm trying to cultivate in song club right now is that, that community of, when we give you feedback, it's for you. It's not for the person giving the feedback. Mm. Sort of the the exam the the opposite example is is like the internet troll who only has bad things to say. They're doing that for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or even the the, of, the music critic that's right. They need to write articles for their job, and so it's for them that they would write critiques of things. You know? Yeah, and they, and they have the full. Uh, full grounds to say whatever they want yeah unhinged you right, know right but <laughs> inside of song club i'm trying to co cultivate this community of we're all here for the same purpose we're all in the same boat let's rise up together let's give each other the feedback that's going to help us grow even if it means yeah this line could be better you can rewrite this like that's fine that's all it has to be you know, right nobody's gonna come for your throat or anything like that there will be people in the world that are trolls like sure don't get me wrong can't control that we all know that um, oh believe me sarah yeah. i'm watching the comments on this live stream there are, <laughs> are there some trolls I'm oh no nah, like, not, not, not too the many chat at all. no it's actually been you know i gotta say <laughs> i i shouldn't i shouldn't use my wonderful reason community as an example of trolls because at the live streams have such a wonderful audience eh, but every now and again you know you, i think any time you do anything on the internet you know you um, gotta yeah you got to have sure. a little bit of a thick skin for that stuff. Um, but, uh, okay, so now David, if you remember, if you th we throw back yes, to the very beginning. Yes, David. He, he gave some information um, about his uh, form of writer's block that he's been sort of suffering. It's, it's, it's in regards to finishing a track, and he added um, a little detail. He says, in my early years, I start with a guitar until I started producing with a computer. Now I tend to switch back to guitar for writing once I finish a track. Uh, it's like coming home after an idea. That's an interesting flip. Um, 
David, I don't know if you're still watching. I, you know, David, I happen to know David's a regular viewer who's in uh, Manila in the Philippines. So I don't know what time it is there. He might be asleep now. He, mm. he's, he wakes up at weird times to watch these. Um, uh, David, if you're still around, um, I'm curious to know if if you're discussing uh, having writer's block, if that came into, if when you moved into writing on the computer, if that actually introduced a blockage that wasn't there when you were writing on guitar and starting ideas on guitar, because maybe... I mean, that's the solution is go back to starting ideas where it was flowing. Um, yeah, how about you, sir? Do you, you start on guitar, right? That's kind of, or, or piano maybe, or. It's so funny. I feel like I'm kind of floating into the space where David is right now. because <laughs> I used to write everything just on an instrument because that's how I learned. That's how I learned songwriting. And I do think that everybody should have a season where they're doing that. Focusing on just writing a song that sounds good and complete and and doesn't need instrumentation to live something that you can play with just one instrument one voice that's that's really how you eliminate distractions and you focus on the song on the composition of the song the lyric the melody the chord progression space structure and arra like arrangement of the different parts of the song um if you can finish a song from top to bottom just guitar vocal or piano vocal then take it into your DAW and play around with other arrangement. Because at the end of the day, um, the track should help tell the story that the song is telling. The track should lift up the song, you know what I mean? Um, if you're gonna have a musical breakdown and you don't play music very well, like me, like I can't like solo on the guitar or anything like that, that's fine. Just play some chords, get some chords in there that yeah. you know are gonna happen at that point in time so you can feel the song like the flow of it from beginning to end, then take it into your DAW and start tracking and adding in those different arrangement parts. It can be so distracting sometimes because like we were saying before, you were saying, Ryan, like you get in reason and like there's just, it's a blank session and there's all these possibilities and tools and players and, and all these things that you could be using. So focus on the song first and then bring yeah. it into the DAW. Absolutely. Cool. Let me just check out a couple other things. Um, uh, this is more just a comment. Uh, LA Winner says, I like to write more versus write better. I found that if I write more, then my writing gets better by itself. That's, that's I think, what you've been telling people as well. So um, good that it's working for you, Ellie Winner. It's one I'm going to try you. and take on board myself because uh, I definitely go with the uh, write less and wish it was better school. And that ain't working for me. So... <laughs> <laughs> Um, with quantity comes quality. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, uh, David, he added something else. I'm a music teacher way back before I became a full-fledged full music producer. I didn't know that, David. That's cool. interesting. That's um, awesome. Oh, um, yes. This uh, comment comes um, Mein Weg als Producer. I'm probably butchering the German there. Uh, Sarah, I did 365 beats in 365 days. I learned a lot. I, that's a quite an undertaking, I got to say. Dude, for <laughs> real. Yo, I have a friend who, her name's Leslie Barth, amazing musician. She's also a teacher, too. Um, Leslie did 30 songs in 30 days. And she did that as a riff off of my songwriting challenge where I challenge people to write five songs in five days. Yeah. And that's a lift. A song every day for five days. Like, that's, let me tell you something. I, you know, easy. when I, when I first joined a uh, song club and you did that first one, I was like, all right, all right. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I made zero songs in five days and uh, <laughs> <laughs> failed miserably. So the fact that, you know, people make it through all four or even get, there's some, I think I've seen ones where you'll do it and you maybe you know, things come at you in life and you get, you, you don't pull it off and you only get three songs in five days and you, oh, yeah. you sort of feel, you know, you sort of, well, oh, sorry guys, I only got three done. And I'm like, Jesus, you got three songs done in five days. That's amazing. <laughs> you know? So. I like to try and set an example just as the host of the challenge. I feel like I need to be like crushing it to show you guys you can crush it too. <laughs> but like, that's life. That's yeah. life. It yeah. happens. We're not always writing a song a day during a whole work week we can try anyway that's a whole other soapbox but when you yes. but out of curiosity so for the in the 30 songs in 30 days um in, in her in her output and i guess in your five songs in five days um do you find uh, is it more common or less common or is it totally random that like the best song comes on day four or five or the the song 22 was better than song three in in her output or maybe i'm applying um Maybe I shouldn't be applying value to a better or worse. Maybe that's even the wrong way to look at it. 
No, it's okay. I, I when I'm just speaking from my personal experience, I doing the five and five. It's called the five and five song challenge. For anyone who doesn't know, it's a free songwriting challenge. It's my plug for it. Come write with us if you want. Um, I do know that feeling of like, oh, I really like this song, and I really like this song from this day or whatever. And uh, and then the other ones are just kind of you know they are what they are, and that's that's fine. That's the whole exercise is to just be writing. In terms of like when they happen, I don't know. It just kind of depends. It's different for me every time. Like I mm. may like, I may have a strong start and then like the rest of the week is just like, I'm just here. You know, <laughs> I don't like these. I'm just showing up. Right. And it's it's all over the map when that happens. But that is, you know? that goes right to the heart of your concept of you can enjoy the process even if you don't necessarily have to enjoy the the final result of the process, you know? Yes, I guarantee you, you will get something out of it every time you sit down to write, whether or not you even, you know that right off the bat, but you are exercising your muscle every time you sit down yes. to write, every time you engage in that process. And it does get easier. The more you do it, you know, it does add up behind you. You will get something out of it, even if it's not a song that you like. Right. Cool. Okay. Look, I am, I'm, I'm snipping the line here um, because, because I'm Cut not nearly done talking to you and, uh, but I can't let my own um, ongoing interest uh, hold you hostage here. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna call it a day here for everybody. I want to thank everybody for uh, their comments and their uh, just kind of hanging with us and talking about this. Um, and hopefully we see some people writing more songs. If you write if you write a song today or this week as a result of something you learned on this, let us know. Let either me or yes. Sarah know. You know, reach out to us. Please. Sarah, you're on Instagram at at Sarah Spencer Music, right? Yep, that's and me. Uh, and online, uh, people can join it. You were saying the, the song club, uh, five day, right. Challenge things that's, is that's open to the public outside of the song club community? Is that true? Yeah. So the five and five song challenge is a free songwriting challenge. I host it every couple of months. We're due for another one sometime really soon. I just have to set it up. But if you go to songfancy.com slash five in five, that's the number five in five. Or if you just Google search the five in five song challenge, it'll come up it's totally free. Uh, happens inside of a Facebook group. So if you, you know, you sign up with your email address, you'll get plugged in. You'll get all the materials that you need. Cool. Now, I'm going to uh, I'm going to put in a request here. I know you have a guitar nearby you. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if we could um, request a, a live performance here. Absolutely. I, I'll admit um, I practice this one, but I haven't done a live since March of 2020. Like I haven't. Well, I've I've done. Let me rephrase. I've done like five and fives live streaming, but I haven't played live. Oh right. Since like March of 2020, so helping me get my skills back <laughs> i haven't done a writer's night or anything in so long but um and uh, i want to introduce this song in a way that gives you guys a takeaway that could be helpful but this song is oh i won't touch the camera it's fine the way she is <laughs> this song was a solo write that i wrote like my first year in nashville first mm. year very green had been writing for a little while but like wasn't like uh, very green just very very green and um i played this darn song at like every writer's night for years just because i knew it well and it was well received at writer's nights and i was like well you know what it's kind of a crowd pleaser it's kind of fun i can kind of get into it and i'm just gonna it was always just a part of every set and i played one particular writer's night with a girl named riley Bourne. And a couple other friends and Riley said, hey, but Riley literally told me like this song is awesome. A year later messaged me, hey, do you, do you have that song? Can you send it to me? Mm. I want to record it. And she wound up putting it out with her um, duo Lone Hollow. So I'm going to play you my version of the song now cool. the way that I've just played it every writer's night for literal years and hope that I don't mess up because it's been a while now. But. <laughs> can we I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm, we're gonna coordinate here a, a yes. very deft live stream handoff move um here's what yes. we're gonna do so you're gonna play this and then you are going to become our outro music so cool. um I'm gonna be saying goodbye to people I'm gonna start talking over top of yours but but what I'll what I want to know is so give me the there's gonna be what uh two verses two choruses and then like 
and and then once we get to that point or whatever the point is the outer point just keep going and i'll be uh saying goodbye to people over top of it so uh, uh okay so but will i will i will it be obvious to me when i should start doing that because i don't want to like step on your song so it's got a little bit of a fake out ending like okay. a, like a tag at the end where okay. the music drops out okay but then i'll pick it up again and, and so after the music drops this. out it picks back up and once it picks back up i'm you're now my outro music and i'll be saying goodbye to people that sounds perfect okay cool yeah cool all right so without oh my gosh. without further ado here we got sarah spencer take it away sarah hey gang oh <laughs> thank you ryan thank you so much for having me this is so much fun i I can't tell you how much I love talking about songwriting and uh, getting to chat with you about it is just so freaking great. Uh, here is I Don't Love You Anymore. Sometimes I admit, I admit I do. I have a little thought, a little think of you, though I don't love you anymore. I don't love you anymore. Yeah, I wonder quietly where you went when you left me, though I don't love you anymore. I don't love you anymore. My friends still meet at our cafe, though I don't go there much these days, cause I don't love you anymore. No, I don't love you anymore. They gave the chapel a new coat of white Though I rarely step inside Cause I don't love you anymore No, I don't love you anymore Oh, every brick and every stone Is soaked in the memory Before you were gone And I can almost fake it saying I who am I kidding? What if I am I living when I tell myself that I don't love you anymore? So yeah, I realize that every day that sun still rises and I don't love you anymore. No, I don't love you anymore. Faith in love has left me in the dust all in my rain but i won't rest cause i don't love you anymore oh i don't love you anymore oh every brick and every stone is soaked in the memory before you were gone and i can almost fake it saying i start saying goodbye to people and Sarah is just going to keep on playing and uh, it's, it's up to her how she's going to vamp for time here go back to chorus whatever she wants to do it sounds great guys listen I am so glad you stuck around with us I'm so thankful to Sarah I hope I'm not distracting her by uh, mentioning her name while she's playing she's giving me a head shake no good <laughs> um, I uh, like I was saying at the top of this stream to to beat makers who don't write songs this is still valuable information to understand the songwriting process because I think it's uh, safe to say that we all hope even if we don't write songs that we're ending up in collabs and sessions with people who do write songs so um, I, I, I think there's something to have gotten out of this for everybody uh, and certainly from the chat I'm seeing you know uh, Smatty this is nice thanks I, I agree 
thanks to Sarah. Big thanks to her. And, you know, maybe we'll have her back on um, in season three. We're now in season two of the Reason Live stream. But maybe we'll bring Sarah back on for season three and we'll delve into this topic further. You guys let me know. If you want more about songwriting and writer's block and how to kind of break through and, and close that gap we talked between your taste and your ability, um, we will absolutely uh, cover this again. And to people who came over from the Song Fancy community and the Song Club community, welcome, stick around, and uh, uh, we got a whole bunch of stuff about music production as well on our channel, so do check it out and subscribe even if you want. But all right, gang, I will be seeing you next time on The Reason live stream. and until then, I hope you guys make some great music. Sarah, keep it going, I'm going to go to your outro card here, and you just keep it going. I'll see you on the other side after I've disconnected.